Hey, hi, hello. What's up, Internet? How's it going out there? Um, sorry, M. Gobo, for uh, baiting you. Uh, he did not gift subs. <laughs> I, I didn't think anyone would really believe it. Um, sorry, I feel bad. Um, but I hope you all are doing well and good. Uh, hope you're having a good Sunday. Um, I'm doing all right. I did a lot of editing and cleaning today. Still not, still not done editing the, um, the quartering and amaranth clips. There's so many of them. So many of them. Uh... I think there's like 15 total clips. It's insane. It's a little much. But they are performing well, so. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, I cleaned up in here. I guess you can't really see. Because it was off camera before, but I cleaned up like this whole corner. Now I have like a little more space to paint and stuff. So I thought I might do that tonight. I need to actually change the camera so it is fitting. I guess I need a different, um... No, I can just put the video here. Wait. Wait, I didn't think about this. I don't have my other phone charged. For a painting cam. I didn't think that part through. Yeah, that's super dead. Um, We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Hi, Lemon Hands. Welcome in. Um, but yeah, I've been meaning to finish this painting forever. Uh, I think I started it in October or something. Fucking year old painting. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to finish this so I can move on to other other things. Uh, I just need to like fix the skin tone. It's like blown out right now. The white balance is kind of off, but, um, even so, you can tell, like, it's too pale. So, that's what I'm focusing on tonight. Um, but I've got a bunch of reacts. I don't, I mean, I, got, I, I don't know if I can really call it reacts, but stuff for you to watch while I paint. <laughs> a little bit more of a low-key vibe tonight. I'm tired, so... I will be I'll taking I'll take breaks to um to talk about shit and and read chat and whatnot, but that's my plan for the evening. I like I still have to post this video actually. I should post that to TikTok. I um I have like an old an old fridge shelf it, like, didn't really fit in my fridge, so it was just, like, leaning against the wall. Uh, it fell. <laughs> and it didn't shatter at first. It was fine. It was, like, intact entirely. But when I touched it, then it just started shattering. But I, something about the, like, the tempered glass, it just, like, it just keeps exploding. It just keeps... Cracking over and over and over again. I had never seen anything like that. It's pretty wild. And you can hear it. It does like a, um... Like a crackly sound. Sounds like Pop Rocks. The more you know. Wait, it's playing. Do you hear it?
Sorry, I'm just gonna post this really fast. How do you spell? Um, anyway, yeah, so I was like sweeping up all the glass, but it's so dusty in here. I also was sweeping up a bunch of dust, so my allergies are just going nuts. I washed my face, but I don't- it didn't really help. You know what I mean? Um, I don't even know what to tag this. Uh, 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 uh. Um, uh, physics, I don't know. What do you, <laughs> what's that phenomenon? Surely I'm not the first person to post about this. I'm not even sure how to Google this. Spontaneous breakage of tempered glass is most commonly caused by chipped or nicked edges during installation. Stress caused by binding in the frame. Internal defects such as nickel sulfide inclusions. Thermal stresses in the glass. An inadequate thickness to resist high wind loads. Interesting. I wonder if there was- it was like a chemical reaction? How is tempered glass made? I'm so, I have so many questions now. Is it tempered even? Is that why? I don't know. Uh, I really don't know what to, what to tag this. Fuck it. Fuck it, we do it live. Oh, perfect timing. Now my camera is ready, so I can just do... Ah. Stop it. Stop it. Fucking TikTok, dude, I swear to god. Why are you like this? Like, why? I swear to god. Ah. I'm pulling it together. I'm sorry. Doing my best, all right? Dark mode. Okay, is it... Wait. It's still uploading. Come on, TikTok. Wait, why is it on 60%? Fuck. Like, Stop. It's so loud. Why? I feel like TikTok is louder than like every other platform. It's just loud. Wait. I don't have. Fuck. I'm such a mess. I need to, like, set up my phone for the painting, but it's here, and that's too far. The other one? 
Yeah, I think I'll do the other one. I am trying. Okay. Or not. Okay. This is the video. Wait, let me turn the music off so you can hear it. I was so amazed. I don't know how much of it is like on video really, but um Hello? Okay, maybe it's still processing. Can you Okay. Oh, it's so quiet. Oh, I muted the site. It just kept snapping and popping. There's like one or two you can see here. Like right there, it just happened. You see? It just pops out of nowhere. It just it just starts breaking again. What is this? Any scientists out there? I I'm so curious. So that was like um, a non-zero part of my day. <laughs> it took so long to clean all that shit up because it like went everywhere. As you can tell, it just like explodes, I guess. I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay. All right. I should probably start painting if I'm going to get anything done. Let's start. A big reason why obese people aren't in these kinds of games is because they can't actually do the physical activity that the characters are doing. No one who is 400 pounds is doing the kind of marathon running that video game characters do to get from place to place, nor can obese people jump around like an acrobat to slay demons. Yes, of course, the most unrealistic aspect of a fat video game character slaying God. demons is that the character is fat and not that they are, you know, slaying demons. Famously realistic and existing demons. Hey. Hey! <laughs> a little while back, I saw a video from this anti-woke, anti-SJW channel called Think Before You Sleep. I made a response to it because it was an odd video, in my opinion, and I thought it'd be fun to do a little more writing training uh, on something like that. For every one of my essays in school, I phoned it in, so I truly do need the practice. I was hoping that he would eventually respond to it, and lo and behold, and other whatever other stuff he did why woke content is trash the video is called there's me on the thumbnail hi to me it's a video about my video which was a video about his video big drama alert woke keemstar signing in if you need to get up to speed all these videos are linked below in episodic order but if your brain just can't handle that sort of relentless pounding i'm gonna try and give as much context as is necessary this video from think before you sleep has four main arguments we're gonna go through each of them but before we do i want to start off with a smaller point concerning the term woke i think this will be helpful to to frame what this channel is sort of all about. After that, we'll get into the meat and the potatoes and the broccoli and sour cream for the rest of it. But for now, let's go. Okay, let's go. So in my first video, I made a sarcastic remark about the vacuous nature of the term woke as it is used by conservatives. What does wokeness mean in this case? Well, we're going to find out, I'm sure. When conservatives attempt defining that term, the definitions they give are almost always incoherent and contradictory. Think Before You Sleep, though, was kind enough to provide a very simple, direct definition for us. One that I thought was interesting, so let's hear it now. Roll the clip. Well, we're going to find out, I'm sure. Communism. Woke means communism. Now the bread tubers love to say, that's not what that term means. It used to mean something else as some sort of gotcha on the anti-woke crowd, but words change meaning all the time. And it was the communists who were using the term woke 
And thus, that's what the word means now. Okay, so the first question to ask here is that if the Dove ad is woke, according to him, that means that it's communist. Where is the communism in that ad? How exactly is it communist? What are you talking about? This point goes totally unexplained other than him talking about who used the term initially, which is not a definition of that term. Now, with that said, uh, in a sense, think before you sleep is not wrong here. To conservatives, the words woke and communist are extremely similar in the way that they are used. These terms mean roughly stuff that I, as a conservative, don't like. Little Joel, the linguistic research channel, uh, his definition is spot on here, I think. As woke meaning just left-leaning politics, liberal stuff. Woke, it okay. means liberal. It means being a, it means being a liberal. It means- Got me too with the Hassan thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel so bad now. <laughs> I got caught by it once, so I'm just paying it forward, I guess. Having liberal politics, particularly about race and gay people. It's a, it means liberal. Conservatives' inability to coherently define these terms doesn't make them meaningless, far from it. They can mean anything conservatives want them to, because they are catch-all terms. And how do we know this? Well, just look at all the things that they use woke to describe. Identity politics, climate change, getting vaccinated, political correctness, communism, liberalism, two ideologies that are definitely the same thing. Just ask any communist on Twitter what they think of liberals. They're gonna so say a bunch real. of really nice things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all my commie friends love liberals. Black mermaids, uh, black actors in general, really, LGBTQ education, fat people in marketing, and my personal favorite, large corporations. Famously communist capitalist corporations. I just thought it was interesting that he basically treated this point as self-evidently true, that woke means communist because communists said it once, when anyone outside of these anti-woke echo chambers would know that that is just so a true. very easily disprovable falsehood. But okay, let's move on now to the main points of the video. Here we go. <laughs> First up, a primary point in this video concerns women's representation in video games. Dove, in their Real Virtual Beauty ad campaign from the last video, they presented some statistics about this topic which were the basis for the campaign. The stat in question here reads, two out of three female gamers in the UK say that there is a lack of representation in video games. For context, last video, Think Before You Sleep argued against this statistic by pretty much saying that he doesn't believe it. Where did you get that number? Did you simply ask three of your British friends? Because there is no way that most British women women are eternally offended snowflakes who care about that kind of stuff. In this video, his first argument against this statistic is that the research behind it Doris wasn't bro? cited in the ad, and therefore we must assume that it is incorrect or a lie. Okay, so I'm supposed to do Dove's homework for them? Dove is the one who brought up the data. They're responsible for telling the audience where their stats came from. It's not my job to Google it for them. If someone gives statistical data and doesn't say where they got it from, then the proper thing to do is to take it with a grain of salt or assume that they are lying. Now, this this is interesting because while I do agree statistics generally should be cited, that makes the process of fact checking easier, a lack of citation doesn't inherently mean that statistics are false. That in and of itself is a bad argument against statistical claims, especially when data exists exist, that shows these claims to be true, and we actually found some of that data. In my video, I cited a survey that corroborated these claims from Dove. In the Opinium Women in Gaming report, the one that I presented, the data lines up perfectly with Dove's claims. When you actually ask female gamers, it turns out many of them do feel underrepresented in games. Instead of engaging with this data, though, Think Before You Sleep initially spends a lot of time just decrying the labor of having to do Dove's homework for them, when he very well knows that this is a terrible argument against statistics. He's not addressing the numbers, he's just saying, this wasn't in the footnotes and therefore I shouldn't have to take this seriously. The fact that this study wasn't cited below the ad does not invalidate these statistics. To argue against it, you need contradictory data, and Think Before You Sleep does not provide any of that in this video. However, he does eventually address the survey in his video, but when he does, he dismisses it uh, in three fascinating ways. First up, he argues that the study is biased because of how they represent the differences in time spent gaming between men and women. Let's take a look at this study that Noah found for us, Diversity in Gaming Thought Leadership. Let's look at the results. It starts by saying that women play games nearly as often as men, just two hours less than their male counterparts. Well, I don't like the framing of that at all. That's not nearly that's a full 20% less. Nearly would be the difference of a few percent, not one-fifth of the total amount. So we're off to a great start with this study trying to make it seem like women play games significantly more than they do. This study isn't heavily biased at all. So 10 hours of boy gaming <laughs> versus 8 hours of girl gaming. He doesn't think that those uh, are yes. nearly the same because 8 is 20% less than 10 and that's...
Yeah, we all know boy gaming is worth um like ten times as much time as regular. That's too much percents for him. So this study is biased and can't be trusted. As a glass half full kind of guy, I would like to point out that eight being 20% less than 10 also means that eight is 80% of 10, which is, you know, it's a lot out of 10. To act as if eight and 10 aren't close numbers is I've never seen such pure, unfiltered, raw Chernobyl levels of cope, especially when those numbers are describing hours spent playing video games in a week. What that means is that the women in the study play games on average an hour and 10 minutes per day, whereas the men play on average an hour and 25 minutes per day. That's just 15 extra minutes per day. Are girl gamer hours affected by inflation or something? Is the exchange rate between those shit right now? I don't, I don't get it at all. The next way that he dismisses this study is where he just straight up lies about what it says on the screen. But let's take a look at the number that Noah pointed out. It says that 69% of women say that there aren't enough female characters in games. Dub's ad was about body positivity, so by their statements, a reasonable person would infer that Dub was implying a reasonable person. Oh, there's your issue. A reasonable person would infer that Dub was implying that two out of three women believe that there is not enough body positivity representation in video games. Not that there aren't enough female characters. Those two things aren't the same. More women does not equal more body positivity. If these are actually the stats that Dub used, then they are lying to you or wildly misrepresenting that study. See how he bakes in this assumption there that this number must be about body positivity because that's what the ad is about, even though that's not what the statistic says, right? If you look on the screen, there it is. The statistic saying lack of representation, not body positivity. I genuinely can't tell if he's being dishonest here or if he just refuses to ex accept this because he doesn't believe it. But again, statistics are not invalidated by one's refusal to believe them. He actually does this again in a different spot in the video. This one's kind of a digression, but I think it's really funny. He he tries to justify one of the claims from the last video that one of the most common things women ask for in relationships is leadership from men. I laughed this point off when he initially made it, but he doubles down on it again, so we just, I think we should address it. This, by the way, is coming from the people who will say, source bro, where's your source man? On literally every claim that you make after telling you that you should Google all their data for them. Particularly when one of the most common things women ask for in a relationship is leadership from men. Source? Can we get a source? Gee, I didn't know I needed a source for common knowledge. You know that's an exception in research, right? Next, he's going to ask for a source on what color the sky is. So we're both using the common knowledge exemption there, right? I use it when I laugh off that claim for just being insane. And he does it when he invokes the dating tips clause. You don't think this is a common knowledge exception? Well then, who has to ask who out on the first date? Is it 50-50? Or is it almost exclusively the men initiating the relationship? That's leadership because leaders are the ones who go first. These are both of our versions of common knowledge, right? So if it's his version against mine, how do we break this tie? Well, we just Google it, right? And what do you know? Look at that. When you actually ask women what they want in relationships, leadership isn't even in the top five. I think he underestimated just how bold of a claim he was making there because he compared an easily disprovable falsehood with knowing that the sky is blue, which, you know, that's that's fun. It's very sassy, very catty from him. Ooh, meow, ooh, meow. These unsubstantiated dismissals oh. of statistics are made because at his core, think before you sleep just doesn't believe stuff. How could women care about representation when he and the people around him do not? Of course, women want to be led in relationships, like kindergartners, you know, being a line leader is a masculine trait because that's what he thinks they want. Does what they say actually matter here? No, uh, of course not. Because his knowledge is common knowledge and you know, that's all you need. If a survey says women feel underrepresented in games, it must be one of those woke gaming surveys where they ask a bunch of woke gamers, woke questions, wokely. There's no way that much of the general population agrees with this woke narrative, considering that in places like America, half the population are conservatives who don't care about this, and tons of liberals are anti-feminist too. Half the population, 170 million chuds. Can you imagine? January 6th is just like, it's like the Lord of the Rings. Don't put your anti-feminist fantasies in my head, man. It is truly fascinating though, watching him dance around for his audience and act like eight hours of gaming is so much less than 10 hours of gaming and act like not being able to find a study means that the study that we found is wrong, even though the study is right there on the screen proving the thing that he uh, just doesn't believe. I just, this is fun for me looking at that and going, what, what, man? Huh? Okay, on to Bumbo Doo. Ooh. The second main argument in this video is about the sexualization of female characters in video games. His first point on that concerns the practicality of Lara Croft's outfit from the game Lara Croft. 
Tomb Raider. And yes, we're going back over this. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. This feels like an apology video with how much I'm apologizing to you guys. I should have just wrote the script down on my notes app and posted it on, on Twitter or something. He doesn't fully clarify why he claims this outfit is impractical, but it sounds like he's saying it's impractical for physical activity. That's not true. How are short shorts and a crop top impeding her mobility? So firstly, my argument that Lara Croft's outfit is impractical isn't that it impedes her mobility. It doesn't. It's impractical because in the game, she's getting shot at and attacked by dogs and alligators and other chew things that want to chew on you. A bunch of bare skin isn't a great defense against those sorts of things, you know? And that's what I said in my previous video, but here he just totally ignores that to talk about how it's you can wear this and run around, which is an easy thing to argue against, and it's not something I believe. Well, well played, epic. Now, all of that isn't me saying that Lara needs to be wearing the Master Chief armor, nor that outfits in video games must adhere to some strict sense of practicality. I don't believe that. The reason I brought up this example, though, is because it's one of many cases in an observable trend of female characters wearing very impractical outfits for the sake of showing more skin and showing more of their unrealistically curvy figures. Anita Sarkeesian, God bless her, she made this same point six years ago in the Feminist Frequency video Linjiri is not armor. Female heroes in video games might be special agents or soldiers or treasure hunters by trade. They often find themselves in dangerous, physically demanding situations, fighting off bad guys and saving the world. They are typically performing activities. Yeah, it's been a while since I painted. Um, way too long. Uh, thank you. Is that call for practical or protective clothing? But when we look at the types of outfits that female characters are made to wear, we can see that they're both sexualized and completely absurd. See, this here, all of this, all of these absurdly revealing outfits, uh, they are impractical, but they exist because the game designers chose to make them that way. And why'd they do that? Why did Chris Shrigley, Andy Green, Rob Toon, Terry Lloyd, Simon Phipps, Dave Pridmore, Jeremy Heathsmith, Kevin Norburn, and Greg Holmes make Laura wear this outfit? Well, because they wanted to, but also, you know, let's not play dumb here. It's for the boys. It's for boys and men who these games have always primarily been marketed to. It's for them to look at and say, damn, the video game lady is hot in a way that doesn't make any sense for the plot of the game. So say the boys and men there. That's me quoting them. On this topic of showing more skin being sexualization, one of the stranger arguments from this video uses a comparison between Lara from Tomb Raider and Cynthia, a character from one of the animated shorts uh, from the Dove ad. His argument goes like this. If Lara is being sexualized for showing a bunch of skin, which he doesn't believe, that's what I argued. If that's the case, then Cynthia, the character from the Dove ad, must also have been getting sexualized because she was wearing pretty much the same outfit, showing just as much skin. Why is Lara being sexualized and Cynthia isn't? He asks, gotcha ing -ly. Are you really going to tell me that this outfit on Lara Croft is an impractical sexualization of the character for the male gaze? But Cynthia here, who is effectively in the same outfit, is not a sexualization of the character? Yes. Um, yes, I am, and here's why. There are two important differences between these two examples. The first one is context. Cynthia is wearing this outfit alone in her dressing room after removing her armor. This makes perfect sense in the plot because that's what a dressing room is for. It's for rem it's where you change the more you know. Lara, on the other hand, is wearing this outfit for the entire game, despite how obviously impractical it is for her objectives. And yes, Cynthia ends up staying in this outfit as she goes on to continue filming, but I disagree that this means means that she's being sexualized. And my reasoning for that is point number two, char character agency. Sorry, I forgot. In Cynthia's story, shedding her armor is her decision, as opposed to a decision made by a group of men trying to sell a game to other men like Tomb Raider. Lara didn't put on her outfit because it is fashionable for her body type, as Think Before You Sleep later implies. Is she wearing that outfit because she's being sexualized? Or is she wearing that because the outfit is fashionable for her body type? <laughs> She didn't put on the outfit at all, actually. Got some guys did. Cynthia has agency in the story for her outfit, unlike Lara, and using that agency to wear clothes that show more skin is only sexualization if you make the choice to sexualize her for showing more skin. That is what Think Before You Sleep does in this video by making this comparison. And then he does it again in a more intense manner at the next thing, which is the whole bent over ass shot uh, scenario. So now we have a bent over ass shot that is center of the frame that adds nothing to the story. They went full on anime camera angles and somehow they're going to claim that it's not an attempt at sex in the character. Now it sucks that we have to do this again because this part makes me honestly pretty uncomfortable. But we do because Think Before You Sleep here tries to weasel his way out of the 
Ferv allegations. And I just cannot let that happen. <laughs> I'm going to play this whole build up clip for context, but just watch how he tries to justify his observation about the anime camera angle. When Think Before You Sleep sees this shot here, to him, it's the same as this shot here. When he looks at this shot, all he sees is this. He's so worked up about seeing a woman from behind that his brain fails to render the rest of the frame. Actually, I didn't even notice this when I first watched the ad. I only noticed it because I was watching a woman review it and she pointed out that Cynthia's outfit was sexualized. So here she is uh, in less clothes, wearing less clothing, mind you, more revealing outfit. See, that's another part that really says to me that they don't care about sexualization. This isn't a modesty thing. She's wearing Basically the exact same outfit that Lara Croft is criticized for wearing. Notice that this lady doesn't ever say anything about the horny camera angle. She's talking specifically about Cynthia's outfit and how it shows more skin. Think Before You Sleep is the one bringing up the anime back shots thing. But he's sort of laundering that take in with the fact that this lady mentioned the outfit as well. He's like, I would never do a pervert thing like that. See, even a girl agrees with me about how her outfit is revealing. So that must mean that seeing her from behind is inherently sexual. That's sexualization right there, what he's doing. If the last point about sexualization that I want to talk about here, it regards body proportions. His argument here goes something like this. Slim, curvy women exist. Wow. So criticizing that body type in female game characters as being sexualized is a way of sexualizing real women that have that body type. There's nothing inherently sexual about this figure, and if you consider it sexualization to see it in a game, then you're the one doing all the sexualizing, you little creep. Is she wearing that outfit because she's being sexualized, or is she wearing that because the outfit is fashionable for her body type? Allow me to clarify this because Noah's line of thinking is something that many people use to attack women for how they were born. Two different women can wear the same outfit, and whether you're a slut or not is determined by your body type, not by the clothes you're wearing. These are similar tops, except one girl has curves and one doesn't. Can you tell me which girl is going to get called a slut? So Think Before You Sleep here acknowledges that there is a stereotypically sexualized figure in our society and culture, the slim woman with curves. As he says, the person on the right is more likely to be sexualized by society because of her figure, and this is something we actually agree on. However, he doesn't stop to wonder why that figure, the one he is admitting is more likely to be sexualized or called a slut, as he puts it, why that body is so overrepresented in games. All of these characters have some variation of that body type and that might make a more self-aware person wonder if the video game industry has a sexualization problem i don't know the last thing to touch on in this section is where he accuses me of body shaming thin curvy woman for the way that i edited my video by censoring thin curvy lara and not average bodied lara wait did he censor thin lara but kept fat lara fully in view do you not understand that you're body shaming curvy women this is a body type that real women have Noah, even you're doing it. I initially thought this was a mistake and he just forgot to censor it because everything else was censored, but this specific image was referred to multiple times and only thin Lara was censored. Unless he doesn't watch his videos for mistakes before uploading, this was done on purpose. Do you not see why I say that body positivity in the cultural zeitgeist is solely about obesity? Noah spent the whole video saying it was wrong for me to criticize obesity because it's air quote, body shaming obese people and that will make those people depressed but then he straight up body shames thin curvy women yeah gotcha i see you said this and you did it gotcha <laughs> briefly to his last point there that body positivity is only about fat people uh remember that this ad campaign also represented disabled women sam who is in a wheelchair and lily who has down syndrome it's not just about fat people you know why lie here i don't why? I see this point being made a lot by anti-wokists, and it's maybe the most deliberately misinterpreted crap ever seen ever in the history of ever. The reason fat people are often the focus of body positivity campaigns is that their representation throughout I be history has been very bad, obviously worse than people who aren't fat. Fat characters are played for laughs, or they are used as plot points for being at their lowest, being defective, needing to go on their glow-up arc, etc. Addressing these stigmas is not the same as shaming people that are not affected by them. And that seems self-evidently true, but in woke bad land, the woke bad lands, you can't be doing that sort of thing, you can't be doing all that. To address the other thing he points out there about my censoring, to understand this 
this one, we need to take a little peek behind the YouTube creator curtain. This video on upload kept getting demonetized. The reasons were not specified with a timestamp as is often the case. So I just started censoring stuff that I figured YouTube might consider sexual content or inappropriate. Much to my annoyance at how it affected the video's presentation, I censored all these characters, but after uploading that version, it was still ad restricted. So I censored Lara, the one referenced in this same section with all these other people. Interestingly, the video was then cleared with the sensors that I applied, despite neglecting to censor average size Lara. And no, that wasn't intentional. It was a 3 a.m. Please clear so I can post this final pass in a few hours editing mistake, much like the one with the forehead being censored with, that he pointed out. You don't have to believe me, uh, and that's whatever. But whether it was intentional or not, to me, plays second fiddle to the fact that it was cleared with only one of the Laras censored. I can't say for sure because again, there's no timestamp given, but potentially what this might say about here is that the bot only clocked sexualization with the thin curvy Lara. The one on the right wasn't considered this is boom, which is interesting, right? Again, this is speculation, but I am having trouble coming up with any other reason as to why this might be the case, other than, you know, the YouTube system is a little bit broken. And of course, that's also true. Could just be that, but you know, maybe it isn't. Uh, maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. I don't know. The third main point today concerns fat representation in games. To start off, let's look at a smaller argument about this, how fat people aren't usually in games because they're too fat to be doing the stuff that characters in video games do. On that note, speaking of realism, a big reason why obese people aren't in these kinds of games is because they can't actually do the physical activity that the characters are doing. No one who is 400 pounds is doing the kind of marathon running that video game characters do to get from place to place, nor can obese people jump around like an acrobat to slay demons. Yes, of course, the most unrealistic aspect of a fat video game character slaying demons is that the character is fat and not that they are, you know, slaying demons. Famously realistic and existing demons. The same critique then also be applied to the demons themselves, right? Like fat demons shouldn't be a thing, not because they're demons, but because they're too fat to be doing all that demoning all over the place. Midway through fighting Ornstein and Smog, smoke starts blowing out of this guy's ears because Smog isn't taking water breaks. I love that, So I love it so much. Also, I don't know if Smog is a demon or just a big scary golden boy, but the point stands because I say so. All right, on to the broader point here about fat representation. So I must admit that in my prior video, I made a mistake, well, two mistakes. The first mistake was the way that I made one of my arguments. I argued that fat representation in media Media can help promote healthy habits. I did this using a series of studies. First, one that showed how positive self-image is correlated with good mental health. Then, one that showed how good mental health is associated with healthy habits. In hindsight, this line of argumentation is not great. It's a stretch because it relies on a lot of correlations. A good chunk of Think Before You Sleep's video covers this flaw in argumentation. And even though, as Think Before You Sleep pointed out, health at every size education can help fat people improve on their health, he points this out and then dismisses the study much in the vein of what we saw before. And I certainly have never seen a real life example of this stock footage of a thin person eating junk food and an obese person not being able to lose weight despite eating oranges. I have never seen that play out in real life and real obese people are always significantly overeating and eating junk food. Despite this, health at every size education is not the same as media representation like we saw in the Dove ad campaign. So I'm hereby raising a white flag on that argument I think it's a bad argument. Now, with all of that said, the real mistake I made here, I think, was playing devil's advocate with this point in the first place. The reason being, you know, the argument that fat people being represented in media it makes people fat is ridiculous on its face. Obesity has been growing in prevalence in America for like 80 years. Mainstream fat positive media is a very new thing. How on earth does it make any sense to point to such media as some serious cause of obesity when clearly there are vastly more significant Significant factors at play if you're sincerely interested in promoting healthy habits why is your first target media that you know destigmatizes fatness there are far more worthy targets to that end like the corporations that heavily market unhealthy foods or the regulations that have shifted how agriculture is subsidized encouraging the use of healthy ingredients or the lack of access to healthy organic foods in places like food deserts now in his first video think before you sleep does bring up Dove's parent company and how they also own a lot of junk food companies but his critique is not actually about those companies. It's targeted towards body positive media, which again, doesn't make much sense considering how little sway, none, 
pretty, basically none, that actually has in regards to the change in public health over time. I don't think shaming fat people is good, and I think destigmatizing fatness is fine, because stigmatizing it doesn't actually do anything positive. And remember, of course, that the sort of response we've seen to this ad from the anti-woke crowd is not about promoting health, obviously not. These aren't health channels, you know, they're anti-woke channels, which are political channels. Anytime they're talking about health, they're just concern trolling to continue their political project of decrying degeneracy in media. Fat people are real, uh, they exist, and their inclusion in media should not, in my opinion, hinge on whether or not that fat person is running on a treadmill and eating celery, limiting their representation as some roundabout individualistic way of getting them to lose weight is insane, uh, full stop, because video games and media aren't and shouldn't be instruction manuals on how to live your life. So to conclude here, yes, I agree with Think Before You Sleep that I failed to make my case about body positive media helping people lose weight. But my clarification here today is that I shouldn't have to because it doesn't need to. Media doesn't need to be helping lo people lose weight all the time. Just media like this can and should exist on its own and proving that shouldn't require that some weight loss contingency be implemented. Uh, you know, it's silly. Chill out, everybody. Leave fucking fat people alone, damn. <laughs> His final point in this video is a call to leave your internet politics echo chambers. His lead up to that is making the case that my channel and other left-leaning channels like it are echo chambers that discourage you from seeking other perspectives. There's so much evidence that Noah doesn't see stuff like this because he lives in an echo chamber and doesn't actually listen to the opinions of people on the opposing team with an open mind. Now, to start off, I do want to point out that whenever I've done these types of response videos, I've always told my viewers explicitly to go watch the stuff that I'm critiquing, and if they're going to engage with it, to do so in a respectful manner. I did this with my response videos to him, and with all the videos of mine that he cites as examples of my echo chamberingness. I feel like that, on its own, is the opposite of echo chamber behavior, but perhaps, mayhaps, that is not enough for you. Maybe you're saying here, well, Noah, only a small number of people are actually going to do that. Most will just watch your video. And if you're misrepresenting the source material, and then they'll have no idea, and that's an echo chamber right there. And that's fair enough, I guess. But also, that's sort of a problem inherent to this platform. This is just how people consume content and how they subscribe and watch creators that often just agree with their political views. To some extent, all channels will have echo chamber tendencies because of this. Think Before You Sleep is no exception either. A bunch of people came straight from his video to comment on mine, either regurgitating his arguments all over my face and mouth verbatim, or telling me to kill myself, or calling me a pedophile, or calling me weird looking. Woke Flanders is fine. I'm fine with that. Flanders is pretty hot, in my opinion, sometimes. Many are saying this. Or, most often, calling me a dummy that got owned. And that's normal, you know? That is YouTube in a nutshell. Audiences failing to actually engage with these ideas beyond repeating what their fave is saying, or using their fave's points as an alley-oop to an epic own dunk. But it is just another example of how echo chamber tendencies are what happens on here. However, Think Before You Sleep later makes a more specific critique, which is, let this content creator's alleged fear-mongering about the algorithm. It's funny how they'll say that they aren't in an echo chamber when they are constantly trying to convince people that watching your first Jordan Peterson video means you're only about a week away from joining the alt-right. Statements like that are called fear-mongering. That's someone who doesn't want you to look at opposing viewpoints. What he says there is a misrepresentation of what we mean when we talk about algorithmic radicalization. The point isn't that people are incapable of viewing alternative perspectives without turning into extremists. I've never argued that, and none of the leftist channels he's probably talking about, have, I've never seen them say this. The real argument is that the algorithm does play a role in how people discover political content, and that role can be very harmful and shouldn't be ignored, especially when young, impressionable people are the target audiences. I have similar gripes with the right-wing radicalization pipeline narrative. I think it's pretty overplayed. I think the primary push to detail this wasn't actually from any of the creators people have decided to label BreadTube, but from think pieces with anecdotes that often relied on wishful thinking about the function of left-wing content on the internet. I also think that the YouTube landscape has changed a lot since, you know, 2016, with the platform cracking down pretty hard on the more extremist channels, the so-called ends of the pipeline. 
offline. With that said though, to act like the algorithm isn't still a problem, isn't still something that leads people into harmful, regressive rabbit holes, that is just an uninformed perspective. Just look at the kids getting brainwashed by Manosphere content. They're quoting Andrew Tate in class, they're displaying extremely misogynistic behavior, they're sexually harassing their classmates. All things that teachers weren't reporting before kids started watching these, these this crap. If Think Before You Sleep's individualistic logic is to be applied here, then problems like these will only grow in prevalence. No, I don't think you turn alt-right after a week of watching Jordan Peterson videos, but a week of Jordan Peterson videos is going to right-wingify your algorithm like crazy, and this algorithmic change is an echo chamber, its own form of echo chamber. And unless you are really taking into account how this is shifting on your page, which I think for a lot of people isn't an easy thing to do, read tons of comments from people that have been into these spaces, that's not good for people, you know? Most viewers will see a perspective and not become a psycho from it, but the ones that can't, they are not helped by this pipeline. This argument is made under the guise that everyone logs into the tube as an unbiased centrist consumer of content when they don't. You know, obviously that's not the case. This stuff affects people. Studying and outlining the harmful effects, I don't think that's a bad thing. It's not fear mongering, it's just being responsible, in my opinion. That's just my opinion, and that's it. There's one. So to give some concluding thoughts here briefly about this video, that's how you can tell I'm not that practiced of a writer that I end my scripts with, in conclusion, <laughs> throughout all of society, in the world, and in the world, has been my thesis statement. <laughs> to give some concluding thoughts here, I think large corporations are bad. I think ad campaigns that support them are also bad, but I think that fat people being in those campaigns is a pretty normal thing. And freaking out about it to the extent that anti-woke people do is weird. It's just seems a little like insane. I don't care that much about what video game characters should wear, but there are clearly trends in games that depict women in an overtly sexual manner for no real reason. And whenever anti-woke channels deny this, it's silly and doesn't make any sense as an argument. So, you know, that's why I talk, I talk about it here. All the other points, you get it. If you watched, uh, you understand. So maybe you don't, maybe you disagree comment below go ahead if he responds to this i guess it's just going to be another even longer video if i have the fucking energy to do it let's do it but perhaps new source material would be a good place to start so yeah that's it uh sorry for the delay i've had a bunch of stuff going on irl which means that means in real life for those for those of you that are like me got some more videos on the way soon hope you are fine and i'll see you later thanks for ciao Greetings guys, girls, non-binary pals, and welcome back to another video. I have not sat down and filmed a video for a little while because I just had a holiday in LA for a couple weeks. So I went to KCON, did some like vlog filming and some other special fun stuff that you can see if you join my Patreon at patreon.com slash savvy cat. Um, I worked on a really cool project, which I'm excited to share, but yeah, it feels real weird sitting down again. It's only been two weeks, but it feels like it feels like forever. <laughs> Speaking of Patreon, before I do get into this video, I would like to say a massive thank you to today's patron of the day, Steve. I appreciate you and all of your support so much. Thank you so much for joining. If anyone else would like to become a patron, as I just said, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash savvycat. It starts at as little as one pound a month and I appreciate it greatly. Today's video, as you can tell by the title, I am bringing you a, another edition to our Pick Me Gay Conservative Queer series. This is a like popular series. People seem to quite like these, you know? There's never a shortage of things to say. There's never a shortage of videos to look at and people to roll our eyes at. There are a lot of hypocrites out in the world. <laughs> and there is definitely not a shortage of these conservative queer Pick Me Gays. And some of the conservative queers we are looking at today are repeat offenders who end up in all of these videos, like Clarkson and Evan, and we get to see what they're up to at the moment and what other stuff they have to say, so 
they're always a fun addition to these videos, um, as well as a bunch of other people that we haven't actually seen before. Before we do get into it, I would like to let you know that today's video is sponsored by Pride Counseling, and I will tell you a little bit more about them in a little bit. This is why public acceptance of gay people is declining. Nobody in their right mind wants to be completely inundated with pride flags for the month of June, whether you are gay or straight. We are all sick of it. I don't need to see a pride flag to feel welcome in my country or to not feel oppressed. Do you know what this says to me? Not that we're a marginalized community. In fact, it says the opposite, that we are a community that incessantly needs validation in order to feel welcome in society because we're so insecure about ourselves. If this is something that you feel like you need every June, ask yourself why. Because anybody in their right mind, gay or straight, doesn't need this or want it. This is not equality. This is privilege. And I hate to break it to you, but true equality doesn't come with privilege. So are we really fighting for equal rights or are we fighting for special treatment? Oh no, oh dear, I can't believe there are pride flags everywhere during Pride Month. It's an attack on me, it's too much, it's unnecessary, it's privilege. Rainbow pieces of cloth everywhere. That is such a privilege for us. Who needs that? Get get over it, bro. <laughs> like it's not, it's not that big of a deal. Like it's pieces of rainbow cloth that are put up around the country to show, you know, support for queer people, right? That's all it is. Um, it doesn't do any harm to literally anyone. It's just rainbow flags that are up. It's not pushing an agenda or forcing anything on anyone. It, they're pretty much, they're decorative. It's decorations, they're rainbows that are there to show support. That's all it is. No one needs it. No one is on their knees begging them to light up the White House in rainbow and put up pride flags everywhere. No one needs it. But it's also a thing of like, it, it's just kind of what happens now. And yes, it is largely performative. A lot of companies and you know the government and everything put out pride flags to show support during Pride Month to make profit off of it and to make you feel safe and secure and then don't care about you the rest of the year. And I think that that's a problem, um, obviously. And a lot of queer people get upset about that, validly. Uh, but at the same time, I do think that it's important in the sense that it does tell queer people that they are safe and that it is okay to be queer, right? Like, not even that long ago, that was absolutely not the case. There was not pride stuff in every shop. There was not pride stuff everywhere, every June. It was a much smaller thing. It was a much bigger deal when companies showed support. So like, although it is largely performative, I do think that it is still very reflective of, you know, how much more tolerant people are now. And also can still help a lot of young queer people feel more normal and more accepted and can help them feel like there is a place for them. As well as I'm sure a lot of older queer people feel really proud to see that and see how normal it is. And everything they fought for is like, exists, you know? Like, if you don't like it, that's fine. But like, get over it. It's not doing any harm. It's literally just flags, okay? <laughs> like, calm down. You don't need it. But you also, like, what damage is it doing being there? How is it a privilege to just have a flag up? Like, showing support is not a privilege. You don't need it to feel safe or welcome. Okay, that's good for you. I'm glad that you don't need that to feel safe and welcome, but some people really appreciate that. Don't take it away from them. This is a video of a Pride Day at a Canadian school where they have rainbows and the kids waving pride flags. And obviously it's just, it's just a pride day at a school. And I'm assuming it's a primary school, an elementary school. But then obviously this guy called Conservative Ant, who is by the way, a founder of Gays Against Groomers, uh, because of course he is, has to add his own little message here. Listen, I know this is Canada, but they parallel us. Pull your kids. It's time. Pull them, okay? Uh, you know, can you imagine if for a second that was going on with this? All riots would break loose. Pull them now. 
Have a great day, though. Have a great day. It's so funny saying, like, can you imagine what would happen if they were doing this with Christianity? Like, every all hell would break loose. Everyone would be rioting. Bro, I don't know if you know this, but one, already there's some weird shit happening at schools of, like, the Pledge of Allegiance, which is a fucking strange thing to do. I don't think that's a Christian thing, but it's still really fucking strange. Um, and then also, a lot of schools do... <laughs> push a lot of Christian stuff. I was unaware of this until recently, but finding out that a lot of schools in the UK have like religious education that's like compulsory, as well as like a lot of hymns. They sing a lot of hymns at public schools, not Christian schools, but they learn hymns and Christian songs that are like, you have to do. Um, I don't know what they do in the US about that, but I know some schools teach things like creationism and their public schools uh, and a lot of other religious Christian based studies. And it's like talked about in class. Like I know that that happens. I've seen people talk about that happening. Um, and let me tell you, there's not riots about it. It's just a normal thing that exists <laughs> in schools. It's a normal thing. You wouldn't say anything about it. A lot of parents love to talk about it. A lot of things have been pulled from curriculums because they don't align with Christian values. Like they might not be going in there preaching Christianity, but they al but they align the curriculum with Christian values, which I'd say is a similar sort of thing. And even that aside, it is so obvious <laughs> that these schools and these places have never had like a culture day. I was told recently that that's like not a normal thing um, that happens in the US. I don't know where else it's a normal thing outside of New Zealand, but every school I went to would always have a culture day or a culture week. And I think I've talked about this before of like, there'd be a whole week or a day set aside that was dedicated to learning about different cultures. So like at intermediate school, every classroom was dedicated to a different culture and like an art from that culture or their food or history or language or a bit of a mix of everything. So you'd have like, I think our periods were 45 minutes long. You would have 45 minutes in each classroom learning a different cultural practice. So there'd be like, uh, we did like Samoan art. There was like Indian food, um, like, African dance, like, etc. There's just a bunch of different things that you would like learn about. I did a whole thing on Indian dance in year seven. We did a whole term dedicated to learning about Indian dance and the culture. And we had like a Bollywood dancer come in and like teach it to us. And then at high school, we did a similar thing, but it had a little bit more um, education attached to it. They went a little bit more in depth. And at the time you were encouraged to dress <laughs> in traditional culture wear. I don't know if that's still a thing, um, but there'd be like people teaching you how to like tie, like put on saris and like teaching you about traditional dress wear. It was all done with the purpose of appreciation, um, but I don't know if they would still do that. A lot of people didn't participate in that aspect of it. It was just all about celebrating different cultures. It was about learning about different cultures and engaging in them and appreciating them and having everyone come together and like, celebrate things and learn about things because it's important to know about the world and about other people and about other cultures. And it just makes people more accepting and it helps aid in people's understanding of people. And just it, it's just such a wonderful thing to engage with other cultures and to learn about them and to admire them and respect them and learn all these things about them. And I'm sure the people who are part of those cultures felt very appreciative of that as well. And that's sort of all that's happening here because like there is a subculture, like gay culture is a thing, right? There's like common ground that we have. There's a lot of subculture. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of community there and having a day that's dedicated to learning about that and about celebrating that like tells queer kids that they're accepted. It helps kids become more tolerant of queer kids and it helps allow an understanding and a connection and people to become more connected with themselves and with their friends and develop this understanding. And there is nothing harmful about that. It's not forcing your sexuality on children. It's not telling kids they have to be gay. It's telling kids that it is okay to be gay and it is telling kids that they should accept people's differences and not just accept them but celebrate them and appreciate them 
And I don't understand why you have a problem with that. I don't think it's worth, I don't know, pulling them out of school and denying them of a proper education. I don't think it's worth that. These people are so just unempathetic and just so selfish and caught up in their own wants and needs and don't care to look outside of themselves and don't care to listen to people and try to understand people and have conversations with people because they're so caught up in how they feel. And I think personally and honestly that that requires a good healthy dose of therapy <laughs> because I am a firm believer that the world would be a better place if we all received therapy. You know, a lot of us struggle with mental health because, you know, the people before us needed therapy and didn't get therapy. There's a lot of people who don't know how to communicate boundaries and don't know how to listen and have conversations and express themselves and empathize with people and not even empathize with people, but just communicate and take the time to try to understand. And queer people are often very much the most affected by other people's lack of therapy and understanding, even from other queer people, which means that we are more likely to be actively seeking out therapy. Let's get back into the video. <laughs> if I had a daughter, which I don't, I don't want her in a locker room with men. And I certainly don't want my son in the women's locker room. It's literally that simple. Well, joining me now to talk about all of this is one of the founders of Gays Against Groomers. Uh, you know him as conservative aunt on uh, Instagram and so many other social media platforms. Anthony Ramondi is with us, conservative aunt. How it's you great doing? to see you, my friend. Good to see you, too. What do you make of this hearing um, and the people that spoke out against this and, uh, and really giving it back to many of the Democrats in the room? Look, I, I give her so much credit for standing up for women because I could have sworn not too long ago there was a bunch of women wearing pink hats that were screaming for women's rights and they've all completely disappeared. And now we just have men wanting to take over women's spaces. And now we're the bigots or they're the bigots because they don't want men in their locker rooms. It's insanity to me. I do have one big question for people who talk about like, I don't want my son going into the women's locker room. I don't want my daughter going into the men's locker room and bathrooms and such. What do you do when you are out with your small child without your partner? If you, as a man, are out in public with your daughter, like if you're at a restaurant, if you're at the movie theaters, if you're at the mall or whatever, and your daughter needs to use the bathroom, what do you do? Because most parents will take their small children into the bathroom that aligns with the parent's gender. So you as a man will take your small child into the men's bathroom with you so you can supervise them. Because if you're sending your small child into the women's restroom by themselves and like what, you're gonna say, no, okay, so I don't have to take my daughter into the men's room, I'm gonna use the parent's room. And the parent's room is what? Oh, the parents' room is a gender-neutral bathroom? It's a gender-neutral space? Wow, and that's fine? And that works for you? Like, <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a wild, wild thing to say. Like, you should be taking your children into the bathroom with you when they are small so you can supervise them. And wouldn't that be so much easier and so much better if that was a gender neutral space, as in the only place that is open for people is where you wash your hands. Like the problem with the men's room is that there's like a urinal like out in the public space, right? Where you maybe don't want your daughter going into that or whatnot, right? And so it's like, if it's a gender neutral space, it's all cubicles and the only shared space is where you wash your hands. And in some cases, the cubicles have sinks in them. You just like go in, use the toilet, wash your hands and then you leave the room. 
Like, why is that a big deal? What is the problem with that? And you're talking about, like, locker rooms. You don't want your daughter to go into the men's locker room or your son to go into the women's locker room, like, where they're getting changed and such. Nudity, firstly, is not inherently bad. We've made it into a sexual thing, but nudity in bodies is not a sexual thing unless it's in a sexual context, unless you are sexualizing bodies, which you absolutely shouldn't do. But, like, even that aside, like, what do you think is going to happen in these bathrooms? Because, like, you're worried about men men pretending to be women, going into women's restrooms and assaulting women. But like, if there is someone who has the intention of assaulting a woman, they don't give a fuck. They're going to go in and do that anyway. They don't have to dress as a woman to do that. Trans people are just trying to exist and use the bathroom they feel comfortable in. They're not going in there for any other purpose. And a predator doesn't care. A predator is gonna go in regardless of anything. Trans people, are just people living their lives that need to pee. And you need to get the fuck over it. I wanna make something very clear. The trans community and the gay community should be completely separate because I'm gay and I don't wanna put on a dress. I don't wanna change my body parts. I've never had the desire to put on heels or a wig, perform in front of kids, perform in front of adults with cocktails at night. I'm not that person, okay? I'm just a gay guy that is happy, happy that we got through the AIDS uh, epidemic and we succeeded that and then gay marriage was legalized. Great, huge accomplishments for the gay community. Why can't the gay community just go back now, live their lives, they got their accomplishments, they got everything that they wanted, they're accepted, they're equal to everybody else, but no, now men, no matter who they are, can put a dress on, say they're trans, even if they haven't changed their body parts, you know, their stuff down there, they can be a total dude and go into a woman's bathroom, a woman's locker room, a woman's dorm room, and say they're a woman and show their junk to any woman that's trying to have her personal space. No, the trans and the gay community are separate. Firstly, I think you got trans and drag queen mixed up there for a second. <laughs> trans people aren't all going out and just dressing as the opposite gender to perform for people. They are expressing themselves as their true gender and living everyday life. Drag queens and trans people are separate, completely separate. And uh, also, yes, trans and gay are two separate things. However, we are part of the same community because we face a lot of the same struggles. And without trans people, gay rights, Queer liberation would not be where it is today. Trans people were leading people in the gay rights movement and we absolutely owe it to them to stand by them and continue to fight for them and with them. You can't just be like, I got everything I want and I don't want to continue fighting. I don't want to be a part of this conversation. I'm just going to leave it and leave them to struggle because I've already won. And also like, I'm sorry, I hate to break it to you, but I don't know since when getting marriage equality is just the end of the conversation, the end of the fight. There's no more homophobia in the world. There's no more homophobia in my home country. Homophobia doesn't exist anymore because now I can get married. That's not how it works. You see it all the time with fucking misogynists too, being like, women have the vote, so now they're equal. It's like, just because you have the same legal rights, which, Queer people still don't have the same legal rights, by the way. There's still a bunch of discrimination that is legally allowed to happen. But even that aside, hypothetically speaking, if we had all of the same legal rights, it does not mean we have all of the same social rights. There are still people being kicked out on the street for being gay. There are people who are being sent to conversion therapy. There are people who don't feel safe existing as themselves. The suicide rates are high. The homelessness rates are high. Like there is not social equality. The fight is not over. Just because you are a cis white man who doesn't struggle to face a lot of this other oppression that so many of us do, doesn't mean that the fight is over for everyone. All right? You can't just sit there and be like, I'm happy so everyone else is happy and I don't want to deal with this anymore. Fuck all of you. I'm going to just like appeal to the conservatives so that I can continue to sit on my throne above everyone else. Like, fuck you, man. You can't do that. I don't understand how you spent a portion of your life fighting for equality or sitting on the sidelines while other people fought for your equality. And then once you have it, supposedly, you then decide you just want to pass it on to someone else to deal with. Like, you're like, I don't have to suffer with it anymore, so I just will let these other people suffer for it because I don't feel like fighting anymore. I've got everything I want. Like, that's such a terrible thing to do. Like, you know how it feels 
And now you're just sitting there and allowing other people to experience that without caring at all and actively trying to disconnect from them. That's just such a terrible thing to do. It's funny to me how we have so many gay rights activists in this country now that gay people already have equal rights. Like, there are so many gay people who didn't come out of the closet until after 2015, when gay marriage was already made legal across the entire country, who now want to pretend like they're fighting some noble fight. Have I missed it? Have I missed the battle? You have missed the war. So you want to be perceived as an activist, like you're fighting for something noble, without actually having to do the hard work of genuine activism. Like, I came out of the closet in 2010 at 14 years old in the American rural South, and even I am not sitting here playing victim or acting like I'm some gay rights figurehead. Because I know that my story and my experiences pale in comparison to what the gay people before me went through in, say, the 80s or the 50s or even the Victorian era. Like, it's such a slap in the face to all of the people who genuinely fought for gay rights, for all of these clout chasers to come in and paint themselves as activists without actually having to do any real activism. And here we are again <laughs> with marriage equality equals full legal equality. There have been, what, like 437 anti-queer uh, bills that have been brought up in Parliament in the US this year alone. That's ridiculous and you want to sit here and say that gay people have equal rights and that they're fully accepted in your country like that's just not even a little bit true already recently it was passed that like people can deny people business because of their sexuality like that happened recently there is not full legal equality there is definitely not full social equality and there is still a lot to fight for it didn't just end because marriage equality happened like that's a fantastic thing it's great i'm glad that like gay people can get married now obviously but that's not the end of it all just because again you are a cis white man who has privilege in every other way doesn't mean you can be like everything is chill now because i have privileges like go away bro <laughs> no one is denying the hard work of queer people in the past. It's just so interesting that, you know, you hopped off the train as quickly as you could. Marriage equality happened and suddenly everything is A-OK, -okay, peachy keen. Gay people are loved and accepted by everyone. And the whole thing of like, look at other countries. They're truly struggling. Like, shut up, man. Two things can be true at the same time. You know, like it can be worse in other places in the sense that, you know, being gay itself is illegal and punishable by death, by prison time, etc. Like, obviously, that is absolutely horrific. And that does happen in certain places. But that doesn't mean that the struggles in other countries aren't real. Two things can be true at the same time. Yeah, you, you can fight for multiple things at once. You can care about more than one thing. That is a possibility to do. And just because you're looking at other people and places who have it worse doesn't mean that what is bad in your country isn't bad. I feel like many of these trans children would have just ended up being gay. And when did we decide that there was something wrong with that? You're actually not wrong at all, and we have science to prove it. So this here is an article from the NIH on gender dysphoria in adolescence. Gender dysphoria being the medical term for struggling with your gender identity. You can see here, after their findings, 80% of children who meet the criteria for GDC, the GD, gender dysphoria, recedes with puberty. Instead, many of these adolescents will identify as non-heterosexual or gay. And do you wanna know the most frustrating part about this? The gay community in America, knowing that 80% of these kids, if they were allowed to go through their puberty, would just end up being gay, are still advocating for them to get on puberty blockers. If we care about gay rights in America, why don't we talk about the bodily autonomy that's being taken away from these young gay children who cannot consent to these procedures. The gay community is literally eating its own under the guise of being inclusive. One crucial piece of information that you are leaving out of this is that this research was done over 20 years ago. I need to correct myself here and say the study itself wasn't done 20 years ago, but the people who are involved in the study were kids 20 years ago. So obviously the evidence of gender dysphoria and stuff is like over 20 years old. 
because they obviously can't do an updated version of this on people who were kids in the current time because they're still kids now. So in order to get an updated version of this, you know, you have to wait until the kids are adults and the times obviously change as that happens. So yeah, that's my bad. I worded that poorly, but the study itself is more recent, but the people it was done on were kids from 20 years ago. Okay. <laughs> and that is a very important piece of information because back then... Being gay wasn't accepted, right? It wasn't talked about. You weren't allowed to talk about it in school. You weren't allowed to validate it. Homophobia was rampant, right? And gender roles were heavily, heavily enforced. If you liked Barbies, if you liked the color pink, then you were a girl. That was a girl's thing. And if boys expressed that they liked that, other kids would bully them and call them a girl. And girls who liked, you know, cars and trucks and the color blue and such and such and such those were boys things if you liked those things then you were a boy right so because of those heavy gender roles and the fact that being gay wasn't on tv it wasn't in books it wasn't in the media it wasn't talked about it wasn't anywhere these kids didn't know <laughs> that that was a thing and because there was no gay representation people didn't talk about it it was seen as this big thing that was just very hush you couldn't ever speak about it right these kids who you know a boy liked a boy you know who likes boys girls do and a girl likes a girl you know who likes girls boys do is of course going to lead to them having gender dysphoria boys can't like boys girls can't like girls that's not how it works boys like girls and girls like boys so if you are struggling with those feelings and you don't know what they mean it's, it makes sense that they would then get confused with that being gender identity. They like the same thing that boys like, they like girls, so that means that they must be a boy. Because they don't know what gay is, no one talks about it, it's not anywhere. And this is why it's so important to have inclusive learning, to have queer representation in the media. Because kids need to know what that is, kids deserve to feel normal kids deserve to feel happy and comfortable and accepted you know 80 percent of those people grew up to find out instead that they were actually gay because they were introduced to what that means you know and i can't say that with absolute certainty but it would be interesting to see another study like this done now where there is more queer acceptance, where people do talk about being queer at schools, where it is seen more in the media. Kids have an understanding of what that means and that that, that is okay. It would be very interesting to see an updated version of this. As you said, 80% of those kids grew up to find out that they were actually gay, but 20% of them weren't, you know? Like, <laughs> and 20% of them, if they were able to receive gender affirming care at that time, would probably be much happier now, you know? Like this is why inclusive learning is so important. No one is trying to turn gay kids trans. It's just that some kids would be so much better off with that option and with the knowledge that they can be whoever they wanna be. And if you go on puberty blockers and then decide that's not what you wanna do anymore, you can go off puberty blockers, they are reversible. You always say that people have to pass in order for it to be valid. If a trans woman wants to use the women's restroom, she has to pass. But it's a lot harder to pass if you aren't able to receive gender affirming care until you're much back older because your voice has dropped. You've gone through male puberty. If you're able to stop yourself from going through puberty, then you're going to be able to pass easier as an adult. Not that that matters, you don't have to like pass, but considering this is their argument, it just doesn't make any sense, you know? Well, I woke up and y'all are back on your bullshit already this morning. This person thinks that I hate pride and oppose the views of my community because of how I was raised. Because y'all are so delusioned that you couldn't possibly believe that you're the problem, right? That I wouldn't have a problem with y'all for any reason other than how I was raised. Let's get into it. First of all, I don't hate pride. I just don't wish to partake because I don't feel welcome there. Why don't I feel welcome there? Because of comments like this. Also, I don't really feel comfy in an environment where we choose to involve children, and even push to involve children, in our schmexual 
choices. It's not cool, right? Like my good buddy Ant says, like Lady Maga says, I say all the time, we were good. We were Gucci. We didn't have a problem. We had rights. We could get married until you tried to involve children. My problem with the views of the community as a whole currently, aside from a select few individuals, is that you want to involve children. And don't say, well, that's not what pride's about. You're right. That's not what pride's about. That's not what it should be about. But you've made it about that. I oppose the community currently, the parts of the community who want to do things to children. I can't even say the word on TikTok, but it rhymes with the um, udulation of children before the age of 18. I oppose smexion in schools, no matter what gender or schmex ed they are teaching, I oppose lewd acts in front of children. I find it so interesting how so many people, queer people included, just make everything about sex. Like, yes, it's a sexuality. Yes, it's about who you are attracted to, but it is so much more than sex. It's also about, like, love, <laughs> you know? And it's about connection. And it's about just comfort in being yourself. There is so much more to it. It's not pushing sex on kids. It's telling kids that it is okay to be who you are. It's talking about love. You know, it's not just sexuality either. There's a lot of romantic orientations that exist. It's also including asexuality. Being trans has absolutely nothing to do with sex at all. Like, it's just absolutely mind baffling to me that so many people just take it and they're like, this is just sex. No, no, it's not. That's literally like the least important part about this. That's not even a part of the conversation at all when we're talking about kids. And also, I'm sorry, but saying you don't think there should be sex education in school at all is the biggest, most horrifying red flag ever. Sex education is so important mm -hmm. for so many reasons. There's so much evidence that abstinence only harms people. It leads to people having more STDs and STIs. And uh, more teen pregnancy. It's not good. A very big reason why sex education and queer sex education is so important in schools is the like AIDS epidemic, right? Because there was no education around that. So safe sex wasn't a thing that people knew about between two men, right? Because no one's ever taught that. And that's why a lot of condom ads now are targeted towards gay men because they don't learn in school that you have to use protection in order to keep from transmitting STIs and HIV. Like, if you don't learn it, then you don't know, right? If you're taught that the only way you can get an STI is like penis and vagina penetration, uh, then, you know, it's gonna happen. And another reason sex education is so important for kids at an age appropriate level is because kids who were being sexually abused and taken advantage of don't know what's going on they don't know how to talk about that they don't know that it's abnormal they're not taught about it so they don't say anything there have been so many cases of kids picking up age appropriate like books about sex with like pictures or descriptors or whatever and showing an adult this is what this person does to me and it helps them hugely if you are opposed Two kids learning about that? Yeah, it's like, it doesn't have to be explicit to be like, nobody should touch you when you're uncomfortable. That's an easy rule. Like, don't make kids hug a family member when they don't want to. Don't do it. Um, You're like teaching them to like, disregard their own consent for a situation. Um, but yeah, like, no one should ever touch you in any capacity without your consent. If you, if you don't like the way that someone is touching with, touching you, then like, you, you can tell me, you can tell your teacher or, you know, like anybody that you trust, like.
than just two kids learning about that, then you are by default just being completely complacent with abuse happening towards children. Like, I'm sorry, but that is what you are doing. It is important to know about these things. It is important to know about consent. It is important to know about your body. It's obviously going to be done at an age appropriate level. And sex education is never about being like, yeah, go out and have sex, go out and do reckless things. That's like literally the opposite of what it is. It's statistically proven that schools that teach abstinence only have the highest rate of pregnancies because people don't know how to have safe sex. They don't know what that is. They don't know how pregnancy happens. Teenagers, kids, they don't have this understanding. Yep. Yeah, I remember when I was growing up, there was a huge outbreak of um, chlamydia and gonorrhea in my area because no one was taught about safe sex or even got tested. It was kind of gnarly. They're more likely to rebel. They're less likely to talk about it and to feel comfortable speaking about sex. They don't know how it works or what it is or how to be protected or how to stop pregnancies. Like you have to teach these things. It's so important. And when you're talking about sexuality, again, it's important to help kids feel accepted. And gay sex education is important because gay people exist and need to know that safe sex is important for them as well. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that you make everything about sex and also that you just are so opposed to sex. I think this is all I have time for today. I mm -hmm. hope that you have enjoyed this video. <laughs> A massive thank you to my Sprout Number yeah. patrons whose names are up on the It's like they repress it so much then they just become obsessed with it. It's weird dude on the screen right now i love and appreciate you so so much thank you so much for joining and a massive massive thank you to my kiwi cat patrons harry toulouse bobby sparrow josh mandy robbie ikazel jessica eldo trini raven danielle so have you ever thought wow a lot of disabled people are also kind of gay well you're not Gage. Hello, lovely people. Big gay. I recently made a TikTok short reel. The big gay, man. About the high incidence of people who are both LGBTQ plus and disabled. And it seems to have struck a nerve. That wasn't what I meant. Yes. In fact, not only do studies from both the American Public Health Association and the Movement Advancement Project find that the prevalence of disability is indeed higher in the LGBTQ plus community, it's one in three of us. Most recent national census data here in the UK also agrees with a Damn. high percentage of disabled people in England identifying. Wait, what? <laughs> I don't even know, like, what is it? What, are the, what is the study? What, are, what were they studying? Hang as LGB plus, gay or lesbian, bisexual or other sexual orientation at 6.4% compared to other disabled people, 2.6%. Interestingly, lesbian, gay and bisexual adults with disabilities are significantly younger than heterosexual adults with disabilities. Although you can watch my video on why are so many young people LGBTQ plus to find out why that might be the case. Click the card in the top left of the screen to see that video. I will also leave it in the description below. So, disability is of course an intersectional identity. You can be disabled in many other things. Hilarious, Hispanic, Hindu, Hungarian, horse rider, for example. <laughs> Just as you can be LGBTQ plus and any other type of person, including actively homophobic. We know from research and census data that people with marginalized yep. identities <laughs> are more likely to experience we were just talking about those people. health challenges, including or resulting in disability, which, you know, partly because discrimination takes a toll on our well-being. Oh yes, you heard me right. Could initial discrimination be the reason for that high illness figure? Well, we'll get to that. But also, kind of maybe. When I first started making YouTube videos and I had to explain to people in the real world what my channel was about. Disability and chronic illness but also LGBTQ plus issues. Why do you look so confused? The main response <laughs> was that it seemed to be an incredibly small niche. Yet something something something, obviously a personal anecdote here, but something something firstly, something. I'm almost at a million subscribers. Love subscribers, Jessica. We have it already. And secondly, that crossover. Oh my god, you really should. Um Jessica's just so wholesome. Does a lot of content like this, and also, uh, if you're interested in reading, she talks about raising her child. 
It's huge. The incidence of disability or chronic illness, and yes, I'm including various mental health issues because mental health is health in any LGBTQ plus group. Mm. Of I love her so much too. She's great. Friends I come across is, is generally much higher than the figures to me suggest. And I realized that I, I am the thing. I'm obviously going to come across people who are also the thing but i could only think of one queer friend group i know who don't have health issues and then i realized they're all <laughs> deaf now in my case i Dutch. felt way more comfortable being open about my sexuality because i already had health challenges that i had to just confront constantly and explain to people non-stop because they aren't always visible oh you're having an ice skating birthday party wow that sounds amazing i would love to come i can't actually ice skate though not because i've never tried it's because it's my connective tissue it's, it's sort of like swine my ankles are just pathologically incapable of holding me up <laughs> and i'm all flopped to the ground like a bag of bones i am a lesbian though so if you have space for a sassy gay best friend i'm right here oh <laughs> kind of gay best friend never mind in comparison Aww. though, liking girls is just this fun extra tidbit that I can share with people. It was so positive in comparison to, really, you want me to list what's wrong with me? And can I just ask, doctors of the room, when you are taught to make your patient recite what is wrong with them, even though it's literally written on the piece of paper in front of you, is it intended to be with the sensitivity that for those who have, have chronic health conditions or lifelong disabilities, you're potentially bringing up a lot of trauma? Because I don't love it. Who would? Real. There are too many things. I've got a quarter of them. Real. Why don't they ever read the chart? Why don't they ever read the paperwork that they made you spend 30 minutes filling out? Why? And then I have to keep like randomly adding them on later. Just like read the front page of the note. I know you're trying to save time, but I promise just like reading the bullet points will be faster than this. So, you know, here we have one possibility. I already have something that makes me obviously very different, so I might as well explore the other things, right? But there is also the fact that LGBTQ plus people who don't have a disability may acquire one due to the direct discrimination against them, whether that be physical, emotional, or even a more systemic issue like lack of access to appropriate housing. Such as a trans woman who wasn't offered a bed in a women's shelter, sleeping outside and developing chronic recurrent bronchitis. But this can start from an early age, with LGBTQ plus students and those who are believed to be such being much more likely to experience bullying or harassment at school because of an actual or perceived disability, with 26% having reported it to a teacher. Now, of course, those are the ones who would tell their teacher that they're being bullied for being both LGBTQ plus and disabled. And the percentage figure is taken from teenagers who accessed services for queer teens, whereas not everyone does. I remember being at one of the schools I went to and some friends of mine were chased home by school bullies who were shouting homophobic slurs and shooting BB guns at them. And that was down a main road with plenty of witnesses. And even though they still had BB pellets lodged in their flesh, they never told the teacher oh. or parent because what were they going to do? Was what Jeez. we thought as stupid teenagers. But I am the adult now. And I am telling you that some adults do care and they will move heaven and earth for you. And you can make a difference by telling someone in charge what is happening. Don't let a bully pressure you into staying silent. If you tell one adult and it doesn't help, even if it makes the situation seem worse in the short run, you just keep trying and you keep telling until you find the one that says enough and puts a stop to it. Lots of adults have their own stories of how when they were a child, an adult didn't help them. So they're trying to do better now. And hey, if that's you right now... Jessica's honestly, like, the best mother. I swear. Like, they're so fucking cute. She's so sweet. Now, and you need help, and you need to reach out, we are out there. I absolutely could throw some more sad statistics at you here, but let's take a break for our special intermission. Famously disabled rainbows. But there are actually lots of famous people who are both LGBTQ plus and have disabilities. And they aren't all white men. Even though that is the most commonly represented demographic when you type disabled wow. person into Google Images. I mean, no offense to my white dudes, you do make out some of my favorite people. It's just that you're not <laughs> all of them. 
of my favorite people, you know? So let's hear it for a better mix of disability representation too. Blind, deaf, non-visible disability, learning delays, developmental disorders, mental health conditions and everything else. How many famous, disabled and LGBTQ plus people can you list? Here are some of my faves. I've seen this person from Lady before in ADHD video. Yeah. Yeah, I think she talked about that recently, how she was like um, diagnosed late in life. Absolute queen, Rosie Jones, who is a comedian and author with cerebral palsy and a wicked sense of humour. British national treasure, Stephen Fry, who's done great work talking openly about having bipolar disorder. Model, Aaron Rose Phillip, who has appeared on the runway for couture designers like Machino, as well Play. as in campaigns for household names like H&M, Dove and ASOS. Of course, Frida Kahlo, the brilliant artist who had polio and spinal and pelvis damage. Chalaman, obviously. Deaf model, painter, sculptor, performer, and intensely interesting human. Lord Byron, yes, the poet. He was born with a deformity of his right oh. foot, which affected him all his life. Wow. Actress, model, and incredibly attractive human being. Gillian Mercado, who has muscular dystrophy. Leonardo da Vinci, yeah, I know. Painter, scientist, sculptor, and architect, who wrote in mirror writing, had kind of erratic spelling, and had a mind unlike any other. Potentially neurodivergence, potentially Hog. dyslexia, potentially epilepsy. Lady Francesca, fabulous drag queen and member of Drag Syndrome, a group of drag queens with Down Syndrome. And I feel like I just said drag too many times. The intermission is over. <laughs> now, I could hit again, hit you, with some fun facts to pull out at parties when faced with people who don't believe in identity politics and don't see colour. Well, there is an overrepresentation of both LGBTQ plus people and people with disabilities in the juvenile and criminal justice system as a fact which only increases for people who fall into both categories, Real. as well as people of colour. Please do explain your thesis on why, Donna, without mentioning race, sexuality, gender and disability. We're all listening. Trigger warning that Donna probably <laughs> doesn't approve of. So, a recent report from Stonewall found that 20% of LGBTQ plus disabled people have faced discrimination in healthcare, and a shocking 59% said that... <laughs> it was not worth living at some point in comparison to 31% of LGBTQ plus people who are not disabled. So, you know how I previously talked about, oh, you're out and proud and about one part of your identity, you're just bound to be more open to exploring other parts. Well, that isn't necessarily the case. I mean, we can't ignore that there is a reason that the most common answer to being trans is a choice is, honey, why would I choose this? Honey is not always the time. As much as we do and should love who we are, we have to acknowledge that prejudice and social pressure from the outside world is real and is strong. I personally don't have any negativity tied to my gayness as it exists independently within me, but I do hate that I have to watch myself before saying wife in front of someone new or explaining that when my toddler loudly says, where's mommy? I'm not his nanny or his aunt, I'm just his mama. Apparently that's a different subsection a parent in his mind and you cannot challenge it. There are mummies, there are daddies, and there are mamas. Some children have one, some have two, and some have all three. And some just have their adult. And the reason I do that is because I'm scared of what that person's reaction will be. Because I don't know. There is an intrinsic feeling of being unsafe. And that is bizarre when what I am talking about is literally just the makeup of my family. But yet I have to somehow check that you as a human being seem like the type of person who won't attack me, whether that's verbally or <laughs> maybe physically. And... I've only a few times had someone... Damn it, Jessica always makes me cry. Man, I didn't want to cry tonight. Stop it. I'm not crying. You're crying. Uh, <laughs> it's literally, like, just, like, who you love. And, like, you can't, like, say that freely. <laughs> I just hate that. I hate that so much. Feels bad, man. Start going on a bit of a, a bit of a funny bit of a funny one um in front of my child and luckily when he's been young enough that he hasn't been able to pick up on it but 
I don't love the intense outpouring of stereotypically not great stuff. Whilst I absolutely would not and obviously cannot change being gay, if you'd asked me before my son was born, I definitely would have said that I wouldn't choose it. Now I know that this amazing little human wouldn't exist otherwise, so yeah, I'm clicking that gay button every time. They're so cute! <laughs> I'm spamming the gay button. I am spamming it. I love them. And whilst on the one hand we can muse about, oh well, perhaps a person with disabilities has less social pressures placed on them to fit into a compact society due to part of the stigma against them that people who are disabled are not interested in sex, intimacy or relationships, which is absolutely something I felt as a very desexed, bedridden, incredibly ill teenager, like, no one cares who you fancy, sweetie, we're just wondering if you'll make it to Christmas. At the same time, there is a very heavy burden placed upon us by having carers who are often family members who may have trouble seeing us as mature and interested in sex and relationships. Equally, the expectations we feel from those caregivers who might have their own very loud thoughts on the gays could lead to internalised homophobia or a fear of coming out and expressing something that might lead to an end in care and a reduction in our quality of life. What a fun video. Spoiler, not everyone feels safe and secure enough to out themselves. Plus, discrimination <laughs> within minority groups is just as big True. a problem as it is. True. Uh, and that's like a blanket good rule, of like don't out someone in a situation if they haven't already outed themselves like uh they may not be at the stage where they're just like coming out to everybody all the time so like don't be like oh this is um my gay friend andy this is my trans uh friend um jessica like you could just use the right pronouns and let them come out on their own terms. <clears throat> it is outside. 100% of disabled people aren't my magically never homophobic or transphobic just because they have disabilities. And LGBTQ plus people certainly can be not the most inclusive when it comes to accessibility and, and different needs. But of those who are able to self-identify as belonging to both the LGBTQ plus and disabled community, the number is certainly rising. Recent statistics show a higher correlation. So again, why the crossover? Well, point two. When people don't have equal rights or feel unacceptable in society, it is no surprise that it directly impacts their health. Discrimination and rejection are traumas. Some studies have even proposed that the traumatic effect of discrimination and rejection on LGBTQ plus people's mental health and physical health can itself be considered a disability. Further research done by UCLA showed that trans people are significantly more likely to report having a disability due to a physical, mental or emotional condition as a knock-on effect of increased isolation and stigmatization. So are we all just getting along? You know what sucks? When it's your friend's big birthday, she's been hyping you up all week in the group chat. You spent three hours getting ready. You've had a great time at pre-drinks, and then you arrive at the new gay club to find <coughs> it's down an alleyway that can only be accessed by some stairs. Oh yeah, and you're on crutches. Brilliant. So even though their website said the club was accessible, they didn't bother to factor in the steep steps outside for some reason. Curse those people to eternally bad Google reviews. Spaces and services focused on the LGBTQ plus community are not always the most accessible. And conversely, spaces for people with disabilities might not recognize the unique views and experiences of an LGBTQ plus person. This kind of gives a sense of invisibility within both communities. Pride Month is a great example of this, right? Organizers of events don't necessarily always recognize or prioritize accessibility by failing to provide accessible routes adequate wheelchair spectator space, accessible toilets, and other necessary requirements. The intent of Pride is that it is for everyone to proudly celebrate their body, gender, sexuality, and physical appearances. So it's kind of a disappointment to say the least when the needs of everyone, everyone to include people with disabilities, are just not taken into account. 
Many LGBTQ plus spaces revolve around nightlife and alcohol, which excludes not only those in recovery or those who cannot drink, like myself, but on the Diet Coke, but also anyone who finds club and bar experiences is overwhelming. Dark spaces, bright flashing lights, very loud music, people crushed together, an emphasis on sexual connections and physical touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a true nightmare for some people. Um... I used to like not mind it, but um, I just can't with my light sensitivity. I can't with the flashing lights. It's terrible. This is one thing that definitely varies based on your location though. Where I live, gay capital of the UK, there are queer knitting clubs, walking groups, rainbow family meetups, movie nights, library events, and dog beauty pageants. I didn't even have to make that last one up. The one thing that can be still a little inaccessible is in-person activism, which might rely on marches or loud crowds to prove a point. Both things I personally try to avoid. There's also the feeling that to be heavily involved may require a lot of energy or time, something we with chronic illnesses and disabilities are often short on. <laughs> but if we can job share, we can activism share. Even an hour or so makes a difference, and there is a lot that can actually be done from a keyboard, whatever people say. Disability Pride Month, first created in Boston in 1990, the same year as the Americans with Disabilities Act was established, is celebrated in July of each year, but didn't come to the UK until 2015, compared to Damn. Pride, which has been well established here since its inception in 1972. But recent years have definitely seen increased awareness and a wider attention to people with disabilities, especially within the LGBTQ plus community, with more spaces opening to accommodate everyone. Queer House Party is a community platform and LGBTQ plus party that now hosts online live streaming events with captions and audio description, and a local space here in Brighton called The Query ran for queer people by queer people advertises as a wheelchair accessible sober space. And at this year's Pride, they had a fun plan. Yay. Very fun. The more the LGBTQ plus community can support those of us with disabilities, the more we can drive policy advances and create positive change, whilst also increasing the understanding of the unique challenges LGBTQ plus people with disabilities experience. Stigma sucks. What a point. Whatever the reason you're facing it. But in some ways, it's also a great opportunity, right? To look to other stigmatized communities and to connect with what they are going through. And that lived experience can definitely make us more aware of the members of our community who are intersection of identities facing more than one battle against prejudice. As president of respectability, Jennifer Laszlo Ms. Rai says, it is And that's it, the core of intersectionality, right? Um, if your uh, identities intersect in such a way that you're facing different types of oppression, um, that obviously complicates your life experience. Um, it's very, it's complex. It's vital to fight stigmas and advance opportunities so all people who okay, face back to painting can achieve a better future. Thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in my next video. Bye bye. This video is sponsored. What up, my name is Welcome back to my channel. I can't even oh. tell you for how long I've been wanting to make this video and this intro in particular. I'm not like, um, gosh, I need to breathe. <sighs> but yeah, today we're talking about the rise of women in sports. It's a pretty big topic, so I'm gonna split it into two videos. The first one is the one that you're watching right now and the second one will be coming in a few weeks. But yeah, before we jump into the video, I need to quickly finish my match.
The recent FIFA Women's World Cup broke all records in terms of viewership and ticket sales. As a sports lover, it was amazing to see the games and to experience that sorority through the screen. And it felt even more special knowing all the obstacles that women had to face to be able to play at that level. Let's take a look back at history to see what I mean by that. Before Alice Mia created the first female sports federation in 1921, sports for women was limited to certain activities which aligned with the women's uh, maternal duties. Women could practice sports, in fact they were encouraged to do so because a healthy, strong woman means healthy, strong babies. But they couldn't do too much. Pierre de Coubertin, who invented the Olympic Games, believed that women's roles in sports competitions was to crown the winners like in ancient Olympic Games. What he said wasn't controversial at the time. It made sense for a lot of people that women weren't meant for sports competitions. After Mia created the first female sports federation by and for women, men quickly incorporated them to their own federations to keep an eye on women, to control their activities. Let's take an example. Well, right after the first female 800 meters race during the 1928 Olympic Games, Sports commentators, journalists, officials, men basically, said that women had fallen mid-run or finished the run in a state of extreme exhaustion. Now seeing competitors finish the race exhausted or about to fall is quite common, isn't it? But officials couldn't stand that. They couldn't stand that women were in that state of exhaustion. And so they decided to cancel the 800 meters race and only reintroduced it in 1960. And it wasn't limited to that race. Women weren't allowed to participate in the marathon until 1984. The first FIFA Women World Cup was in 1991. And very recently, in 2011, women were finally allowed to do ski jumping. That was yesterday, and gosh, they had to fight for it. Even if women now have access to pretty much any sport competition, well, they are still systematically relegated at the bottom of the agenda. Their competitions are usually organized at times where it makes it difficult to follow in the morning, at night, or even during men's podiums. All of that to say that, beside their career, women have always had to put time and effort and energy into getting equal treatment, time and energy that they could have put into training. Us being able to see the FIFA Women's World Cup is the result of all those fights and an inspiration to not settle for what was previously achieved. When we talk about the fight for equality in sports, the tennis player I am cannot help but think about Billie Jean King, who has done so much for women in tennis. A ferocious women's rights advocate and an overall badass, King lobbied to get equal pay at the US Open and proved her point in 1973 by beating Bobby Riggs, self-proclaimed king of the male chauvinist pigs. Let me tell you a bit more about this story, later called the Battle of Sexes, because I find it kind of funny. So Bobby Riggs, former American tennis champion who left the circuit in 1962, claimed in 1973 that women's tennis was so inferior to men's tennis that he'd be able to beat any woman on the tennis court, even the best female players. On Mother's Day in 1973, he did beat Australian player Margaret Court, a female champion. After the match, he said that he was the women's tennis champion and joked that even the best female tennis players weren't capable of winning against a man, quote, with one foot in the grave. That's when Billie Jean King comes in. Riggs said that he'd give her $10 if she bid him. Challenge accepted, said King, who arrived on the tennis court like a modern-day Cleopatra sitting on a chair held by a muscular, shirtless man. Riggs, on the other hand, wore a sugar daddy shirt and was followed by a group of young, attractive women. Billie Jean King actually won the match and encouraged Riggs to shut up for good and leave women alone. King's victory was important for women's sports. Because of that, she managed to get equal pay at the US Open. I mean, the King versus Riggs battle of sexes kind of remind me of my experience as a tennis player. As years went by, less and less girls would play, and so I ended up being one of the few, if not the only girl in men's groups, in boys' groups. Now, those boys and men were not exactly as Riggs, but they still couldn't stand to lose against a woman, especially a teenage girl. So when I'd win against a boy or a man, they would find 100 excuses, sometimes they wouldn't even congratulate me. They got really, really mad, and I'm sorry to say this, but I felt amazing in those instances. I felt amazing because I grew up being told that women are weak, that we're not competitive, that we're not as good as men. Now, sure, it's rewarding to win against a man, especially the chauvinist ones. It's unhealthy how much I love this. But the thing is that usually when you have a woman and a man of the same ranking, the man tends to be better than the woman. 
it's important to acknowledge this difference and to try to explain why, because if we don't do it, then others will come up with their own arguments, like the one I mentioned earlier, women aren't born competitive, they are weak, fragile, emotional, etc. People who come up with such a statement can even go as far as reappropriating women's fight for equality to their own advantage. I'm referring to the men who say things like, see, you got what you wanted, you can do the same sports as men, but look at you, you're really, really bad at it. And that proves my point, which is that women aren't meant for competitive sports. Honestly, I can't remember how many times I've heard men at my tennis club say things like it's unfair that this woman has this ranking because if I had to play a match against her, I would demolish her. That's why in my tennis club and in all the tennis clubs around where I lived, women wouldn't get the same rewards as men. And in my tennis club in particular, they even thought about removing the female category from our local tournament. Women are always evaluated in comparison to men, as if we were in the same category. I could have been the best female player in the circuit. I could have demolished all the other female players. I could have won as many matches as men competitors. But I would never get the same rewards as men, because even if we were separated in two distinct categories, my performances, our performances as women, were still measured according to men's performances. Because of that, women's sports are deemed less interesting, less valuable than men's sports. And to compensate for that, federations and local clubs have used different methods to ensure that people don't get bored when they watch women's sports. They have added new rules, for example, among them bikini bottoms for beach volleyball players, skirts, no, no suits, Serena, <laughs> skirts for tennis players, Shorter sleeves, tighter tops, and shorter shorts for soccer players. I mean, you gotta provide some sex appeal, ladies, otherwise viewers won't care about you. I will elaborate on bodies, the relationship with the body in women's sports in another video, in the part two. But for now, let's go back to our initial train of thought. So why do women perform less well than men of the same ranking? Let me try to answer that question using my own experience as a tennis player, but also as a tennis instructor. As a teenager and young woman, I built my confidence around the fact that I could outperform men in sports, in science, in every field where they are supposed to lead. I was really, really proud of that. I wanted to show primarily boys, but also girls, that all the negative stereotypes associated with femininity, uh, womanhood, were wrong. Because here I am, look at me, I'm contradicting all of them. At the time, that's what feminism meant to me. It was about going against all those negative stereotypes. I felt really bad whenever a girl would run like a girl, throw a ball like a girl, uh, play this or that sport like a girl, because I thought that boys and girls would see that as proof that, yeah, girls are really bad at sports, at math. They aren't really funny, aren't they? And they're kind of dumb. To give you an idea, it's the exact same feeling as when you watch a debate and your side is losing because they are saying the very thing you hope they wouldn't say. Now, of course, since then, I understood that feminism is way more than going against the stereotypes to prove men wrong, that there is nothing wrong with femininity. But that frustration did not leave me when I went from being the tennis player to the tennis instructor. It was honestly a struggle to see that when I asked girls to throw the ball with all their weight, not just their front arm, they just couldn't do it. And of course they couldn't do it. They had already internalized that a girl, a woman, is not supposed to use too much space, to get too much attention. I hated that. I hated that so much. Not the girl, obviously. No, I hated the fact that an eight-year-old had never experienced what it feels like to hit the ball with all her weight. And unless I was there to progressively work on it with her, she would have probably never experienced it. Because a skill that is not practiced gets forgotten. Going back to soccer, the experience I've just described is very similar to the experience of Nicole Labar, a former female soccer player who, like me, gets frustrated when she sees that girls feel self-conscious about running fast or kicking the ball. She also felt that same insecurity many, many years ago when she was the little girl sitting outside the field, silent and disciplined. She ended up joining the boys she was watching by pure coincidence when the coach asked her to replace a player. She said to the coach, no, no, I don't want to play, I cannot play. To which he replied, I need to find a player real quick, you're gonna play. And she said, but I can't, I'm a girl. Girls don't play soccer. No, don't worry about that, we'll call you Nicholas. Several years later, she became a little champion. It's a shame it's in French because Nicole's energy is just chef kiss. She concludes by saying that, People say women don't like competition. We do that to lose weight, right? Now, of course we love competition. Of course we like to challenge ourselves. Of course we like to win. Of course we have muscles and strength. Of course we do. 
And yes, some people could say that, well, if women like to compete like Nicole, like you, Alice, they'd find a way to do it. But the fact is that they generally don't. And that says a lot. This sort of statement is pretty much the same thing as if you really want something, you can achieve it. But when you put down the side and look at what is really happening, then you'll realize that it's not as easy as it seems. In fact, when I was researching, I realized that Nicole, Marta, myself, and many, many other uh, female athletes all have one thing in common. We all met someone that helped us develop our potential. For Nicole, it was the coach who needed a player. For Marta, it was thanks to Elena Pacheco, who noticed her early on. For me, it was Jack, the former president of my tennis club, who every weekend would train me for two hours with the machine. I would hit something like 1,000 balls, I believe. It was insane, I was exhausted. As Nicole said, soccer came to her, she didn't ask anything. And it's the same for me. If I hadn't had the chance to have someone like Jack, who would play with me for two hours for free every weekend, who pushed me to join my first competitions. Who knows, I would have probably dropped tennis at around 12, 14, like most girls did. It is connected in a way to what Malta said in her interview. É que quando eu comecei a jogar, eu não tinha um ídolo no feminino. Vocês não mostravam o jogo no feminino. Como que eu ia ver? Como que eu ia entender que eu poderia chegar a uma seleção me tornar uma, uma referência? Having the chance to have met someone who got us out of the path that was set for us as women, meaning a path without competition, without competitive sports, having role models, these are the things that got women into sports. This is why we have all these amazing players, athletes, competitors, that make us feel so many wonderful things. But we can't just rely on that. We need better representation on the field with referees and players, but also in the studios, with people providing expertise and commentary on the sports but also in federations, administrations. And all of that combined will inspire more and more women to turn sports into their career, a sustainable career. Most women in sports didn't choose to be political. I'm sure a lot of them wouldn't even identify as feminists, but the fact that they evolve in a men's world means that their existence is inherently political. Like when Spanish players said they would no longer play in matches until the federation's chief, Luis Rubiales, resigns. That was political. That was feminist even. But I assume it's not something that the players enjoy doing. They didn't choose to get political. They just won the games and wanted to share the joy with others. Rubiales is the one who politicized the whole thing by kissing one of the players without their consent. There are so many things to talk about on the topic of women and sports. I'll cover some more in the sort of second part of this video. But for now, I would like to conclude with one thing that often gets brushed off when we talk about the Women's World Cup. And that's precisely that it's not just about women, right? It's about queer women, lesbians in particular. It's important to say it again and again because a lot of people felt uncomfortable with the fact that yes, the women they saw on screen, that they loved, that they supported, that gave them so many emotions are queer, are lesbians. Yeah, some felt uncomfortable when Spanish player Esther Gonzalez kissed her girlfriend in front of cameras, or when they saw that New Zealander Ali Riley had painted her nails with the rainbow flag to counter the FIFA ban to wear LGBT armbands, or when British player Lucy Bronze refused to shake Infantino's hand. Some wished that the Women's World Cup was just gonna be a hashtag girl power moment, but it was not, it was much more than that. I mean, players made sure that it was more than that. So once again, by virtue of existing, of embracing who they are, they made the event political. Now don't get mad at me for being such a bummer, but I feel like the revolutionary potential of this event, an event represented by queer women, working class women, uh, women from all over the world, could get absorbed by capitalism. By that I mean that it turns into something like Pride has turned into. Pride started as a revolutionary movement representing the most marginalized people in society and turned into a rather apolitical, corporate friendly event with sparkles and heteros everywhere. And naturally, I also fear that the origins and the marginalized identities of the players get exploited to feed the meritocratic myth. Sure, we should celebrate that these women are put in the spotlight because it is extremely rare and it is extremely beneficial for the greater acceptance of LGBTQ plus people, working class people, etc. But I think, and you know it very well, it's always good to remain a little bit critical. I mean, I love to see women get so passionate about sports and share that with a wide audience. But I hate the fact that in order to do that, they have to take part in an institution that is known for its male chauvinism, its corruption, its corporate greed. 
So yeah, I guess that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, the conversation continues in the comment section. I'd love to hear about your experience of sport, so if you have anything to add to what I've said. As I said before, I couldn't cover everything. There's so much more to say, so the comment section is meant for that. I also would like to thank my patrons for their supports and a special thank you to top tier patrons. Ria, Joey Esguera, Ivan, Remy, Trebizond, Toki, Korichi, Tristan, Patricia, Ian, Donage, Alex, Ren, Edwin, Sam, Manuel, Alexis, and Perry. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video. And yeah, salut! I'm just gonna get this out of the way early. Almost everyone in today's video is trash. This guy, trash. His mom, his homeboy, these guys who work for him, they're the entire landfill. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, bro, hold up. You cannot just come on the internet and call somebody's mom trash. But honestly, that's where you're wrong. Nuance is a very valuable concept, but sometimes it's just more appropriate to simply be mad. And in today's video, I am big mad. I know this will come as a big surprise to many of you, but I personally am not the biggest sports guy. I don't really tune into games of foot basket or hockey ball. So you can imagine my surprise when the story that absolutely boils my blood the most recently came straight from the world of international soccer. And it is terrible, and I'm going to break it all down. This guy, Luis Rubiales, committed this totally unacceptable act against one of his players, Jenny Hermoso. Instead of resulting in his immediate firing, as it should have, these actions instead revealed that he has this weird sort of conspiracy of people around him who protect him and cover for him, ranging from his subordinates all the way up to his mom. Like honestly, he and everything associated with him in any way whatsoever is just a mess. So now without further ado, let's get into this video. So very short backstory. As many of you know, the FIFA Women's Cup is a huge international soccer tournament that takes place every four years. And after weeks of playing in this tournament, Spain had actually won the Women's World Cup for the first time in history. So naturally, people were celebrating, and rightfully so. The crowd was going wild, there were people all over the field, like everything should have been so fine. But unfortunately, one of the people on the field was this guy, Luis Rubiales, president of the Royal Spanish Football Federation, aka the RFEF. And amidst all the applause and celebration, for some reason, he decides to kiss one of the soccer players full on the mouth without her permission in front of the cameras and everybody. This understandably caused a huge uproar, as it should have, because what he did is gross. Like by itself, it's just not appropriate, considering that he has this much authority over her as the president of the governing body over the sport that she plays. But what makes this far worse is that she did not in any way, shape or form consent to be kissed by this man. And he just went for it anyway, on camera, no less. And here's the thing, I'm not gonna play the clip in question. Obviously I've seen it myself. It's circulating all over the place because the story has been blowing up. But even just a still image from the scenario shows how disturbing this is. Like, look at this. He just has this wildly aggressive grip on her entire head with both of his hands. And it's obvious what he's doing, even though it's obscure. You can even see her arms out like, whoa, hold on. And in the video clip, you can see that the whole thing is exactly what it looks like. He just grabs her head, two hands, and pulls her towards him and plants a kiss right on her face. It's just an exceedingly gross action on his part. And it is very uncomfortable to watch can't even really imagine how uncomfortable it was to experience. And like, besides being objectively wrong, it's just a weird thing to do. Like, it was so weird that I feel like at the time, nobody even knew what to say, not even Rubiales and the player he kissed. But unfortunately, things are about to get a whole lot weirder. So the person that Luis Rubiales forcibly kissed is athlete Jenny Hermoso. She's obviously hugely talented and accomplished and her skills paid off, hence the team's win. But in addition to that, I'd say she's also just very professional considering everything that happened and to be clear you don't have to be professional in this scenario like we are way too obsessed with this perfect victim narrative where even if you are the one who was wronged you have to be like really polite and be this innocent angel 24 7 or else society will discredit you and for some reason treat you far worse than the person who wronged you like honestly Ginny Hermoso had every right to lash out if that's what she chose to do but I feel like the fact that she didn't says a lot about the difference between her and his 
misdemeanor. Shortly after the incident, Jenny said in an Instagram live stream with her teammates, referring to the kiss, hey, I didn't like it, but what do you do? And I know it's a rhetorical question, but honestly, what do you do? I feel like sometimes you can just be so taken aback by an action that you don't even really have an opinion on it in the moment. Not yet, anyway. Rubiales, on the other hand, had much stronger words to say, instead shrugging off critics during a quick interview. The kiss with Jenny? There are idiots everywhere. When two people have a minor show of affection, we can't listen to idiocy. I think the immediate problem with his characterization is this wasn't a two people sort of scenario if she said that she didn't like it. This was a decision that he made and then forced upon her. So the next day, Rubiales actually apologized, though honestly, it was not much better. He didn't apologize to Jenny so much as apologize to the world for kissing her. Here we saw it as something natural and normal, but on the outside, it has caused a stir because people have felt hurt by it, so I have to apologize. There's no alternative. He also apologized for calling people idiots, saying, I want to apologize to those people. I'm sure they have their reasons. I'm also saddened because this is the biggest success in our history in women's football, the second World Cup that we've won, and this has affected the celebration. Again, I think this apology would have meant a little more if this was actually a consensual action, but in this case, Jenny actually actually came forward and sort of implied that maybe things weren't necessarily as bad as they seemed. It was a mutual, totally spontaneous gesture because of the huge joy of winning a World Cup, she said in a statement to news agency EFE. The Prezi and I have a great relationship. It was a natural gesture of affection and gratitude. So I mean, seemingly, that could have been the end of it. If what she was saying is true here, then the incident, while still very inappropriate, wouldn't have been as just deeply wrong as it seemed. But unfortunately, in this case, it was pretty much as deeply wrong as it seemed. Shortly after Rubiales' half-hearted apology, the Soccer Union Foot Pro gave a statement where they clarified their stance on events, as well as let Ginny set the record straight on what actually went down that night. And this time, she could not have been clearer. I want to clarify that as seen in the images, at no time did I consent to the kiss that he gave me. They strongly condemn Rubiales' actions in no uncertain terms. From our union, we want to emphasize that no woman should feel the need to respond to the forceful images that everyone has seen, and of course, they should not be involved in non-consensual attitudes. The union went on to explain that everyone involved would refuse to play until Rubiales no longer occupied his position. After everything that happened during the medal ceremony of the Women's World Cup, we want to state that all the players who signed this document will not return to a call of the national team if the current leaders continue. All 23 members of the winning team signed this document, along with 58 other players, bringing the total number of signatures to over 80. But see, here's the thing. A lot of people like to use moments like this as some sort of gotcha, because they'll be like, wait a second. First, she said that it was mutual, but now she's saying it wasn't consensual. But to do this is to act like it's just this completely unheard of concept to protect your abuser right when the abuse allegations come out. And this is not some sort of unheard of phenomenon. This happens. When rapper Tory Lanez shot Megan Thee Stallion, she initially covered for him because she was in shock and she didn't think anyone would believe her. But that didn't make it a lie when she came forward after the fact and all these years later, he wound up getting sentenced because he did in fact shoot her. Now, obviously these are not the exact scenarios, but I bring it up because once again, we're talking about this perfect victim narrative. No matter how much duress you're in because someone just sexually harassed you in front of everyone or shot you literally you still have to give the perfect testimony right off the bat you can't get anything wrong you can't change anything you can't lie to protect yourself or because you feel like no one would believe you it's just it's honestly so frustrating and it doesn't change the truth of the matter and the truth of the matter is she did not consent to that kiss with that man and since she decided to come forward about this luis rubiales totally lost it instead of apologizing resigning like people wanted him to or even just laying low for a little while rubiales decides to hold this unhinged press conference where he basically self reports for like an hour about how willing he is to lie about things that have been caught on camera so like obviously this clip is in spanish but i'm just gonna play you this part where he just starts chanting i will not resign and then everybody at the press conference literally starts applauding him like it basically turns into some sort of weird fan rally and you just have to watch it no voy a dimitir no voy a dimitir. No voy a dimitir. No voy a dimitir. No voy a dimitir. I'm sorry, but a man who sexually harassed one of his soccer players, refusing to take accountability for it, and then getting applauded by a room full of people who saw. What did he say? I'm not lying? Or something? I'm not going to lie? 
No voy a dimitir. No voy a dimitir. No voy a dimitir. No voy a dimitir. I'm sorry, but a man who sexually harassed one of his soccer players, refusing to take accountability for it, and then getting applauded by a room full of people who saw him do it. It feels like some sort of really messed up joke. Like, to be clear, there's no punchline. It's not funny. It just has that element where it's like, how am I supposed to take it seriously that this actually happened? I feel weird watching this, and so I can't even really imagine how it feels to be Ginny in this scenario. But Rubiales, my dear friends, was just getting started. If it wasn't enough to so blatantly refuse to take responsibility, he actually starts discrediting her and making her out to be a liar in front of everybody by trying to fabricate a story despite the fact that the things he's saying in his defense are just easily disprovable from multiple camera angles the kiss was consented we had very affectionate moments the moment jenny appeared she picked me up from the ground that we almost fell and when she left me on the ground we hugged she took me up in her arms and we hugged that did not happen it just didn't happen. You can see in this video taken before the kiss, he puts his arms around her and then he just lifts his legs up, making it look like she's picking him up. Like, look, I'll play it again and you can see he moves before she does and then she sort of braces herself against the weight. And he's lucky because I would have dropped him. But like, really, the fact that he's trying to make it seem like she initiated this is absurd when he knew that hundreds of people were filming, so there's no way anyone would actually believe him, right? except for the fact that everybody applauded him. And like, if you really just think about the structure of the narrative that he's building, he's literally just saying that she asked for it. Like he's saying, oh, actually she initiated contact. She picked me up. She consented. He's just saying that she wanted it. So in current day, modern age, we have this man who sexually harassed this woman. And then he proceeds to say that she wanted it. She consented, even though she said she didn't. He just knows what is happening here. Besides trying to shift the blame on Ginny, he says that this whole thing is actually just a hit job from, and this is a new one for me, false feminism. Whoever sees the video will understand that in front of millions of people on television, in front of all the people who were there, the desire that I could have in that kiss was the same that I could have kissing one of my daughters. That is understood by anyone and even those who are in the media. False feminism is a scourge. First of all, you Ew. should not be kissing her in the scenario at all, let alone without consent, let alone someone who is your subordinate in a context in which you are effectively at work. Like the fatherly nature that he's trying to evoke here is completely irrelevant. And to blame this on not feminism, but fake feminism, it's just so nice. nonsensical. I don't even really have a response for that. Like the man is literally just saying words at this point. But yeah, those were just a few notable moments from an unforgivably long press conference in which he also informed us that a social murder was being carried out and that they are trying to kill him. Great to know that the president of the entire Royal Spanish Football Federation is, as mentioned, completely unhinged. And it turns out that the entire Royal Spanish Football Federation, yeah, they're trash as well. Because instead of choosing to distance themselves from whatever the heck his behavior was, uh, they instead issued a statement in which they backed him up and threatened Ginny with legal action for coming forward. The RFEF and the president, given the seriousness of the content of the press release from Foot Pro Union, will initiate the corresponding legal actions. This is such a blatant and utter misuse of power by a federation in order to protect people coming out against the federation's leader. After this press conference, Rubiales tried to release this bombshell proof that actually jenny was in the know the whole time but like the proof is literally just a video of jenny laughing with her friends about the kiss sometime shortly after it happened which doesn't prove anything at all compartmentalization is a thing things can be traumatic but you can also be in certain scenarios where you're not necessarily expressing that. I feel like some people think just because you can't see things, it means they don't exist. It's like between this nothing clip and his phony story about her lifting him up off the ground, nothing he says actually defends him. In fact, everything he says makes him look worse. So it's like, not only is he the worst kind of person, he's just not very smart. And as it turns out, the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Apparently, one of Rubiales' cousins confirmed that his mother went on a hunger strike, locking herself in a church to protest the unfair treatment 
of her 46 year old baby boy i'm gonna be honest when i first read this my brain completely refused to accept the possibility that this could be true it doesn't even sound real i was like you know what this is clearly just the cousin trying to get their 15 minutes of fame right because whose mother would actually do that and like the cousin didn't exactly seem like a beacon of journalistic integrity i mean they also gave us this wonderful quote the way they are treating him the aggression the feminists the television it seems to me shameful so wait was it feminism or false feminism are the feminists in the room with us right now but no as much as i desperately wanted this to be like an unsubstantiated tabloid rumor unfortunately it got proven true because they actually found the church where she was staying at on the second day of her strike it turns out his mom on his bear wound up causing just a mini media circus in the middle of his hometown because people were scrambling to interview her and miss bear was ready for her close up. I don't mind dying for justice, she says in an interview. My son is a decent person and it is not fair what they are doing to him. She basically makes this self-imposed martyrdom into Jenny's issue as well, saying, I'll be here until my body holds on and I won't stop until Jenny tells the truth. It's worth noting that the very next day she ended her strike and went to the hospital because she said she felt dizzy. So I guess she actually wasn't willing to die for justice. And like, good no one should be dying in this scenario obviously but the fact that his mother was so willing to not just overlook his behavior but completely excuse it really shows how he wound up like this in the first place and the fact that she managed to invalidate another person's suffering while somehow making herself the victim like it just it really explains a lot it really explains a lot because if you think about it these are the exact same moves that he was making he took a situation in which he was causing distress because he harassed somebody and he's trying to turn it into this thing where he is now the victim of a completely imagined enemy that is false feminism or real feminism i can't keep track now at this point everything just seemed like a gross media circus and honestly like a mockery of jenny's decision to come forward because rubiales had faced precisely zero consequences for his actions but even though so many top level spanish football personnel reacted in such a disgusting way towards jenny's very rightful complaints thankfully there's a level above the RFEF, and they are a lot more concise and a lot less litigious. FIFA, the host of the World Cup and the governing body of international soccer itself, quietly announced just four days after the incident that they would be opening disciplinary proceedings against him, as his actions may constitute violations of Article 13, paragraphs 1 and 2 of the FIFA Disciplinary Code. Now, if we take a look at this disciplinary code, we see that Article 13 references offensive behavior and violations of the principles of play, which sounds about right, and I would suspect that Rubiales most likely violated subsections a b and d of paragraph two namely violating the basic rules of decent conduct insulting a natural or legal person in any way especially by using offensive gestures signs or language and behaving in a way that brings the sport of football and or fifa into disrepute and the only other comment they had besides that was that they basically had no other comment the fifa disciplinary committee will only provide further information on these disciplinary proceedings once it has issued a final decision on the matter fifa reiterates its unwavering commitment to respecting the integrity of all individuals and strongly condemns any behavior to the contrary. And that was all they wrote, in that update at least. But unlike the RFEF, it looked like FIFA was actually willing to do its job, because just two days later, they updated everyone again. The very next day, after Rubiales' embarrassing press conference, FIFA announced that he was actually suspended for 90 days from all football related activities as the disciplinary proceedings continued. Besides just taking punitive measures against Rubiales, they also outlined some protective measures for Jenny Hermoso herself, ordering Rubiales to refrain through himself or third parties from contacting or attempting to contact the professional player of the Spanish national football team, Miss Jennifer Hermoso, or her close environment. They also extended this no contact order to the RFEF as well, and then they ended it with yet again one of the coldest closing lines I've ever seen in a corporate document. FIFA reiterates its absolute commitment to respect the integrity of all persons and therefore condemns with the utmost vigor any behavior to the contrary. Last time, they just strongly condemned it. This time, they condemned it with the utmost vigor. I'm pretty sure that's as close as you can get in corporate speak to saying you are big mad and they were probably extremely embarrassed by his press conference and how he's making soccer look in general now at this point i think the royal spanish football federation realized that their decision to not only support rubiales 
but also threaten the person who came forward against him with a lawsuit probably fell right into FIFA's definition of things that they condemn with the utmost vigor. And seeing as FIFA equals their boss, it should come as no surprise, despite being incredibly two-faced and slimy, that they suddenly changed their tune overnight. The very first business day after FIFA handed out the suspension, they put out the following statement. After the latest events and the unacceptable behaviors that have seriously damaged the image of Spanish football, the president's request that immediately Mr. Luis Rubiales present his resignation as president of the RFEF. This came less than a week after they basically pledged their undying loyalty to him. The RFEF remains committed to continuing to implement its investment, as well as equality policies for the development of women's football. This is such a disingenuous thing to say when, again, less than a week ago, they were just threatening to sue a woman in their women's football division for coming forward about serious things that happened to her. So yes, I have no problem calling the RFEF trash, but unfortunately, like, it doesn't stop there. It's like, the more you look around, the more you realize how many people it took to enable this man's behavior. This problem has very deep roots. For example, the head coach of the soccer team that Ginny Hermoso was on, it's this guy named Jorge Vilda, and he spoke out against Rubiales after FIFA's decision as well. I regret deeply that the victory of Spanish women's football has been harmed by the inappropriate behavior that our, until now, top leader, Luis Rubiales, has carried out and that he himself has recognized. This statement is a little weird to me because it seems more apologetic to the victory that the team experienced than Jenny herself, but I I guess at the very least, he did say that the behavior was harmful, which would be good, except for the fact that he's just lying through his teeth because he doesn't really think the behavior was harmful at all. See, you might have missed it, but let's go back to that weird applause moment from the press conference. And wouldn't you know it, there's Jorge Vilda himself clapping and nodding along with the rest of them. See, all this backtracking is actually indicative of a much larger issue, which is that some men vocally take a stance against mistreating women, not because they actually think it's wrong, but because they would get too much societal backlash for admitting the fact that they don't see anything wrong with it at all. It's just a completely self-serving kind of support that does nothing to actually support women and instead makes it way more difficult to detect scenarios where abuse is taking place because everything just seems like it's on the up and up since everybody is just so darn supportive. It's that exact kind of hidden enablement that allows the open secret situations that you see in so many of these scenarios. Like everyone sort of knew but nobody really said anything because they don't actually care. They just want the social benefits that come from appearing to care. In fact there is one thing they do care about. Notice how both the coach and the RFEF statements mentioned how this situation was overshadowing the recent win. These people care more about the reputation of Spanish football than they do about the actual women on the Spanish football team. Like no matter what they're saying or doing now, you cannot tell me that these people actually think there's anything wrong with what he did. Because as trite as it is, actions do speak louder than words. And so despite their words, the RFEF's actions to threaten Ginny Hermosa with a lawsuit for coming forward against one of their own, that speaks louder than what they're saying now. And the action that Coach Vilda took to publicly support Rubiales at this unhinged press conference, that speaks a lot louder than the words he's now saying now that FIFA has passed down the suspension. And you know, one of the most frustrating things is they're not actually wrong about this whole controversy completely overshadowing Spain's win. If you Google Spain soccer right now, this is all that pops up. There are no celebratory articles, no interviews with the players, nothing on the front page at all except coverage of this man and what he chose to do that night. And then the absolute garbage storm that he and everyone around him decided to kick up afterwards. It's like they behave like children, but they have all the power of a grown man and it's kind of frightening the more you think about it. Like this is a 100% self-imposed problem, right? Obviously the assault is the most grievous thing in the scenario, but also just the way that he's so willing to continue putting his foot in his mouth and making these disgusting statements and continually detract from the amazing victory that was his team's win also says a lot about just how gross of a person he is. Luis Rubiales is a bad person for a number of reasons, and he's finding new and myriad ways to disrespect the women's soccer team every single day. And for as much as they claim to care about how this is taking away from the player's achievements, the RFEF is no better. And if they hadn't made an absolute fool out of themselves by banding together behind him and even going so far as to threaten this woman, I don't actually think people would be as shocked by the story. Like, unfortunately, 
these things do happen and what should have happened is that he was immediately dropped but because we saw the complete opposite of what should have happened the shock factor just totally blew up and so now that's all anybody can think about when they think about Spain winning that cup people are calling on coach Vilda to resign and in this case I think he should it's not like some weird guilt by association thing where you dared to exist around somebody who did something wrong you were supporting that and the person he wronged is one of your players so why are you on the team now while this scenario is definitely leaving me with a little less faith in humanity than i had before i don't want to leave you thinking that everything is just totally hopeless i've obviously been focusing mostly on these gross men who are doing their gross man thing but it's worth noting that very many people were totally against this from the very beginning. There were actually protesters, rightfully, demanding that Rubiales step down in the street. And as for the sports world, Ginny Hermoso's teammates were not the only ones who stood behind her. Other women's teams showed support with signs and wristbands saying, we're with you, Ginny. Even men's teams were out on the field with signs saying, we are Ginny, and shirts saying it's over, referring to Rubiales' time as president. And it's things like this where even though you hate the context, you at least love to see the support. And as for me, I have nothing but support for Ginny Hermoso. I think the way that people are standing up for her around the world is kind of what I wish I could see for all people who are victims of abuse or assault or harassment. Obviously, nobody should ever be abusing, assaulting, harassing people in the first place, and that is the real issue. But another huge issue is that, unfortunately, not everybody is sort of treated the same way as Ginny has been after these incidents occur. Like, thankfully, her very prominent position as a star player on a team that just won the world championship, that's brought a huge spotlight to the scenario that she was thrust into. But these things often happen to people who are completely out of the spotlight and have no means or platform of really speaking out against their abusers the way that Ginny was able to via her official statement from the union. In addition to knowing about her story, people believe Ginny about her story because this was caught on camera. There is no real way of interpreting the footage other than exactly what happened. But unfortunately, in these scenarios, things are often a lot harder to prove and they're not exactly as cut and dry as what we saw happen here. So people wind up getting discredited and disbelieved because of it, with many even finding themselves being blamed for their own mistreatment. So while I am very grateful to be able to use my platform to speak up in support of Ginny, I wouldn't want to just get attention on this video without also acknowledging the many untold number of women and other people who are in abusive scenarios and maybe don't have the same resources that we've seen in this situation. But that doesn't mean there's nothing we can do. There are organizations like the National Sexual Violence Resource Center that provide services designed to connect people with the help they need in these situations. And I was fortunate enough to get this video sponsored, so I'm going to be donating $3,000 from that sponsorship to the NSVRC. Donations are not the end-all be-all because the real way to solve this problem is for people to stop harassing and assaulting and abusing other people in the first place but there are people who need help right now and that help takes resources and so if i'm able to sort of help with those resources i see no reason why i shouldn't do so i would also ask you to help in any way you can and again that does not just mean donations even just being there for people goes a very long way whether that's through volunteering for a helpline or even just listening to people who come forward anyway part of what makes all of this just feel so disturbing in the back of my mind is like the the intensely uneven power dynamic between Rubiales and Ginny Hermoso. It's not like this was done by a fellow player, which would still be completely unacceptable, or done by her coach, which would still be a power imbalance. This was done by the president of the entire organization that is Spanish soccer. It's like this man was just determined to overnight embody everybody's idea of like a creepy guy who abuses his position of power to take advantage of female employees. And he was determined to do this loudly in front of everybody and to get away with it. And for a scary second there, it kind of seemed like he was going to. But actions do have consequences. And as of this week, a criminal investigation has officially been launched. So I can only hope this all quickly arrives at a just resolution without causing too much distress to the victim of Rubiales' actions. And at this point, it really is sort of just in the hands of the authorities. Overall, Luis Rubiales, his mother Angeles Bear, head coach Jorge Vilda, and every single member of the Royal Spanish Football Federation are trash. This video is just like a new personal best for how many garbage human beings are being discussed at the same time. And so I am honestly glad it's over. Anyway, thank you for the support. Thank you for watching if you happen to make it this far. And as always, can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye.
So, Fresh and Fit got demonetized and kicked off the YouTube partner sharing program. Let me just start by. Woo! Reposo. Crab dance. Okay, I just need to um, wash my hands real quick. Do we like my painting? I think it's coming along. We're going, we're going places. We're getting there. Got the wing sand on the wake. They'll probably be back. I know, I know. And I agree, getting demonetized is really bad. It's bad for you, it's bad for your channel, it's bad for your pockets. But their channel at the time of recording is still on YouTube. Unlike Sneeko, their channel did not get deleted. And so when that is the case, there's always a high likelihood that behind the scenes, they're sending emails and having meetings and they will probably return. While it's a nice little moment to go and point and laugh at two of the biggest idiots on the internet of the last few years, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time doing that in this video. Instead, there's an element to their rise and what they represent that I want to focus on to make a greater point. So Fresh and Fit, I think, started in 2016 and blew up during the pandemic like a lot of new creators, yours truly included. And if I'm fair, they are probably the inception of the modern plague of alpha male podcasts. They spent most of the last three years kind of like streamlining that formula by being incredibly misogynistic when they weren't embarrassing themselves against anyone who wasn't drinking the red pill Kool-Aid. Like the one time they met with a woman that they didn't hire and pay to be a guest on their show and she kind of made them look bad. But we all know fresh and fit. What I wanna know more in the moment is why were they demonetized now? Why wasn't it after misogynistic moment number five or misogynistic moment number 500,000? Why not after another red pill guy tried to fight a black woman on their podcast? Why not after numerous racist jokes about black women, Asian women, etc.? I'm trying to figure out what was it that triggered them finally getting any type of consequences for their awful rhetoric on their show. I've heard others say it's because they tried to illegally put in copyright claims on other channels, which will get you demonetized. I've heard people speculate it was their recent feud with Abin Preach, where they acted like monkeys and I think did like Hitler salutes and shit. I honestly don't know, but I feel like whatever got them demonetized, it wasn't misogyny. Misogyny, that's okay. They got 1.5 million subs, though with far, far less views than their regular content, which is something I'm gonna bring up later. They got that big and didn't get taken off the game until they crossed some specific line that we know wasn't spreading hatred of women. For three years, hatred of women was A-OK. -okay. And I want to dig into the full ramifications of what that means in like, in like a broad spectrum and how it relates to my personal view on the red pill and combating the red pill. Many people often accuse me of always thinking that I'm right and never taking criticism, which is untrue. And as an example, I'm going to, in this moment, like represent and rethink some stances I've had in the past that I don't think hold up anymore, specifically on why the algorithm content works the way it works and why some content doesn't get the views and visibility that other content gets. So this is me directly responding to criticism from the video I released a couple of weeks ago regarding the left isn't helping men ongoing discourse, specifically. I wanna take back what I said about the algorithm being responsible for the proliferation of red pill content and why men's content from progressive or leftist voices don't have the same spread. I made it seem like the computer itself, knowing that this was viable content that leads to engagement, was pur purposefully overspreading this type of content and radicalizing lots of young men. That's not the most accurate situation. It isn't really the algorithm's fault because the algorithm is a reflection of the audience. It's always been that. And it's time to face some hard truths about who the audience for this type of content tends to be and what they really need to help themselves. So you know how a few years back, Facebook got into a lot of trouble because it was being accused of helping to radicalize lots of people on far right message boards and Facebook groups by boosting negative posts and content, much of which contained obvious misinformation, which led to low key, the probably the election of Donald Trump, a bunch of COVID denial in the January 6th uprising. Pretty much a lot of the awful shit that's been going on the last 10 years is partially due to the spread of misinformation and the polarization of Americans into 
ridiculous and dangerous ideologies. However, recent studies have somewhat absolved Facebook explicitly as the cause for that particular problem, YouTube as well. What recent studies have found is that certain content grows not because it's radicalizing and converting ostensibly normal and neutral people. Instead, the research seems to indicate that there's a population of people who are already predisposed to certain belief systems, and then they gravitate to certain content that supports that belief system. And then once they get to that content, then the algorithm begins to do its job of bubbling, filtering, and insulating them from any other type of content that might push them off the platform. This may be called a radicalization process, but the key thing to understand is that normal people aren't being radicalized from a benign and neutral position into a far right extreme one. It's people who are already pretty entrenched in a particular belief system that get further polarized by the algorithm. Yeah, they get like reinforced. Um, what, there's like a name for this. Like a uh, reinforcement bias or something where you're just like biased towards information that like reinforces the beliefs that you already had. Oh, I forget what it's called. Algorithm, but they were there to begin with. Now this means a lot of things, but for this video, it should pull into context how ridiculous it is to genuinely complain that the red pill is winning because the left isn't trying hard enough. This argument hinges on the idea that all these poor, vulnerable guys are just innocent little boys until the silver tongued red pill podcast come and mind control them into becoming raging misogynists. Again, so many of you, my viewers included, give us content creators far too much credit for what is happening out in the real world and why certain behaviors and ideologies are present in society. Nobody is a blank slate. Men and boys on the internet aren't fucking Eevee from Pokemon just waiting to see if the Pokemon trainers what? will use the red pill stone or the blue pill stone. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. What the research is telling us is that if you're here <laughs> watching this video, congrats. Uh, you did something well. Well, my worldview is shattered. I thought everyone was just an Eevee waiting for a red or blue pill. That's what I thought before getting here to open yourself up to what I have to say, or at least that's what the algorithm thinks about you based on your watch behavior. My content individually has not convinced or converted anyone into a different ideology that they weren't already somewhat interested in. And anyone that tells you that their content does this is full of shit. What all of us are doing as content creators is doing a form of education on these ideologies, but your presence here is voluntary. You have to be somewhat interested in this topic and open to it to even have the chance to see the video to click on it in the first place. That is and kind watch of it. the algorithm it's works. True. The algorithm sees in you that you may fuck with this video or for some of you, you just love to hate videos like this. And so you watch them for some type of weird, like need to feel alive by just wasting your time watching content that makes you angry. I don't get that part of y'all out there. Fuck y'all. I don't feel free to not. You can click off the video. So the ugly truth is that when you say your little innocent baby friend started watching a bunch of Andrew Tate videos and started to change, you might want to consider that he maybe wasn't all that innocent to begin with. And like, I'm not talking about your friend being a little problematic or a shitty boyfriend, although those are bad things. I'm talking about your friend that has very much changed their personality suddenly after watching red pill content. Understand there are so many things that have to happen prior to make that a possibility. The process of radicalization, according to research, does not start with your for you page on TikTok. As I've pointed out several times, the problems that men face around engaging with their emotions, living healthy, less destructive lives and treating women. I don't know. I do think there's like some normies that might not know that they're being radicalized until it's too late. I do think that's like uh, definitely possible. Whether that's like because the content is targeting the biases they already had, I think it's kind of irrelevant. Like, it, the pipeline is there, you know?
I don't think you can deny that. Women in their lives better and with more respect is the result of a grooming process for how we, at least in the West, learn to understand masculinity and gender. And that process begins at like three or four years old. Your widow friend didn't just discover Andrew Tate and then suddenly start thinking misogyny is a good idea. He's been engaging and witnessing misogyny since he was a child. It started the first time he was told he couldn't cry. It started the first time he heard like a girl used as a pejorative statement. The first time his emotions were weaponized against him because that's how girls act. If no one has been there in those early moments to counteract this type of grooming, or some other fortuitous life experience didn't break him out early, then that is when your friend began on this path to being a red pill guy. Now, plenty of men grow up with this same grooming, but don't go as far as the red pill. And there's a reason for that that I'll get to later, but it needs to be understood that when it comes to appealing to boys and men, the red pill has a significant advantage in that it directly builds upon the mind state that young men already have. And leftist theories about these issues are at a severe advantage because they're starting from the exact opposite end of the spectrum where they're not very willing to go. The fact that Fresh and Fit just got demonetized and probably temporarily is an example of this. They were allowed to exist because according to the terms and conditions of YouTube, their behavior, this respect, one of the mandatory ingredients for respect. You guys want to know what it is? Fear. Of losing of, yeah fear whether it's physical violence or of loss but the point is is that woman needs to be scared was normal and there was an abundance of prospective viewers who felt the same and in fact really enjoyed it around 1.5 million as of now so i have to correct myself it's not that the algorithm presents tons of red pill nonsense that radicalizes young men and boys is that there is an and it does of men and boys already online seeking regressive and misogynistic content to consume and red pill grifters are there to collect it's not a battle for the souls of young men it's a gold rush but it gets deeper than that this is jason wilson i've talked about him multiple times because He's kind of awesome and like a perfect example of why this there are no good male role models argument doesn't hold up to reality. Jason Wilson is straight, married, classically masculine. He's a karate black belt. He's been doing work around masculinity for years. And when you watch him, he's not talking about marks or hooks or Judith Butler. He doesn't use big $1 million words. He's just doing karate and having really powerful, meaningful conversations with his wife and children and working with young men and teaching emotional intelligence. I fucking love this dude. And there's nothing left wing about him as far as I can tell. What was masculinity first? Because I thought masculinity, the word itself, was a comprehensive definition of a man. All right? It's not. It's attributes. Harry Tubman was masculine at one point. You understand what I'm saying? And so, so you're telling me that we've allowed an adjective to define what it means to be a man. One adjective. Women don't do that. Women never let a culture, never have let culture define them. They rebel. Um, like we were talking earlier that uh, the saying was a woman's place was in the kitchen. You rebelled against that and proved that that's a big lie. For men, we say, no, you're only masculine and we don't rebel against that. And so my whole thing, when you think of black masculinity, so you're saying because the word itself, the definition means uh, attributes traditionally ascribed to men such as strength, boldness, and aggression. So you're saying black mas so you're not saying black masculinity like black manhood. What we're saying is the lady. black aggression, <laughs> strength, and boldness. All right. So we're not talking about manhood. The prohibition. So do you, are you seeing a state of men uh, being more milksop? Uh, men who lack courage? Absolutely. Men who are very passive and passive aggressive? Absolutely. And that's because they don't understand truly what it means to be a man. They only understand what it means to be masculine or non-masculine. And most of you talking about where are the male role models don't even know who we I don't even know what, what that really meant. Because I feel like that was a lot of people talk. Is. For another example, someone just put me on a podcast called The Art of Manliness. And holy shit, this podcast is a treasure trove of relatively traditional and simple yet deep advice and discussions about living a good, useful life as a masculine man without blaming women for every little thing or making women into perfect vessels of virtue. Tons of great stuff to be had there. And I know that they're not unique in what they're offering and are out there if you look for them. Like, seriously, for those of you that are like trying to get your little friend out of the red pill, you probably shouldn't start with me, honestly. I'm not gonna be the best starting point for someone that deep in. 
my Manosphere videos, I think, are really good, and they're not like my most radically left videos, so they may be of some use, but they're they may good. be more amenable to Jason Wilson. They may be more amenable to the Art of Manalist podcast. They may be more amenable to Raven the Red Flag podcast. Shout out Smaller Podcast as another example of the same thing. You don't have to jump directly into gender theory in order to be a better man. There's way more room for you to go before you get to where I'm at. It's just keeping it a buck. But that said, I wanna own another mistake. One of the last times I mentioned Jason Wilson, I made it seem like he was small compared to Red Pill guys. That's not the best way to make my point about his lack of visibility. Cause Jason Wilson isn't invisible. Jason Wilson is huge. On Instagram, he has 800,000 followers. On Twitter, he has more followers than me and Fresh and Fit guys. He has been on The Breakfast Club. Damn. He has written multiple bestsellers. The Art of Manliness podcast has- I've never heard of him. Has over a million subs on YouTube and their podcast is in Spotify's 1% of most listened to podcast lists. These guys aren't small fries. They're fucking huge. But this begs a question. Why haven't you or your widow friend getting sucked into the red pill heard of these bigger figures? Why are you guys saying that there's nothing out there for men that isn't misogynistic when there's clearly huge figures out there showing you the opposite? Could it be because you aren't actually looking for it? Going back to the point about how the algorithm works, the ugly truth is that your friend didn't get sucked into Andrew Tate and the red pill because he was looking for advice on how to be a better man. Your little friend got sucked into the red pill because he kind of hates women, or at least that's what the algorithm figured out about him. And that's the reality of the situation. The algorithms hack our brains and read our tendencies. They pay attention to what we engage in and pay attention to what we ignore. It knows what we will consume and come back for, and it knows what we will discard. I know who Jason Wilson is because I've known him for years at this point because my algorithms on Facebook or whatever fed him to me a long time ago because it knew I would respond to what he had to offer. I didn't know who Andrew Tate and Fresh and Fit were until y'all forced them into my feeds. And there's always gonna be people in the comments being like, I don't know who these people are, Oh my God, you guys get a golden ticket. You are so lucky, I envy you. People really fail to understand that red pill insult types are a vast minority of people. Now, misogyny is running rampant in all men. That's the patriarchy, all that good stuff. But the red pill motherfuckers, they're small. Like going back to Fresh and Fit's 1.5 million subscribers, if you go and look at the view count for a lot of their videos, none of them barely reach that amount. They're getting maybe 80, 100, 150,000 views per video. And this is because the boys and men that find themselves there at a low point in life will eventually get the fuck over it, grow up and move on with their lives. They may still pay attention to laugh at the antics of these figures as the buffoons they are, but they will never really buy into the shit long term. They don't change their behavior based on it. This is the reason why shorts and clips of these red pill creators get so many views, but their actual long form content gets so much less. And it's not just me, the male feminist saying this, it's other more normal men. Like remember when Fresh and Fit went on Flagrant 2 podcast and Andrew Souls afterward didn't even want to put the episode out and then Fresh and Fit tried the sales because they were so alpha and told the real truth about the red pill and then Flagrant 2 showed the footage to an audience of relatively normal dudes who thought fresh and fit looked like a couple of clowns. I didn't want to put the pot out. Oh, you didn't want to put it I out. I told him, I was like, I don't want to put it out. You guys are going to look bad. My beef isn't with podcasters. My beef is yeah, with like, um, institutions. Like I like, like I like talking shit about politicians. I like talking shit about like institutions. I like talking about big grandiose things that like the only way that you can combat it is with ideology. I'm not really beefing with other podcasts. So I said, yo, you guys are not going to look good on this. I don't think we should put it out. Yeah, because they were like, put it out. We should give him the option, though. I yeah. don't feel like they came off that different on your episode than they do on their show nah. every night. Maybe, right? And maybe that's why. No, no, but, but it's, it's a different crowd, though. Flagrant 2 aren't some progressive socialist leftist podcast. 
They aren't behind the bastards, but they are much, much bigger than any alpha male podcast will ever be because they're appealing to actual normal dudes, which is why they were embarrassed that they shared their platform with a bunch of incel red pill clowns. <laughs> Your algorithm's endpoint is Andrew Tate. And it's funny because he also embarrassing losers in a lot of his content. But his main thing is shitting on women in a world that makes you feel like the loser you are, but also makes it seem like it's not your fault. Instead, he allows you for a moment to experience a world where you aren't the loser, where women are, and men who actually have functional relationships with women are just simps and soy boys, and you're the one that knows the secret truth about the world because you took the red pill, which I wanna remind you, wanna remind everyone, is a metaphor for estrogen created by two trans women from the movie Matrix. You all are so yep. fucking stupid. I hate that I keep making videos about y'all. This <laughs> revenge of the loser's ethos is the reason why so much red pill content is labeled why modern women fail. Feminist gets embarrassed by facts and logic. Loud girl gets destroyed when alpha male puts her in her place. That's so typical. Y'all aren't attracted to my shit. Y'all aren't even attracted to Jason Wilson shit. Why are we still having this conversation? The solution to your problems is you. You don't need my videos or Jordan Peterson's videos or even Jason Wilson's videos. The first thing you need is intention. And then after that, social support, personal development, education, probably hygiene. And if you're lucky, therapy <laughs> to help you work through how you got to this point. You are not Real? going to undo a lifetime of grooming under patriarchy with a few hours of YouTube videos. If I have helped any of you in any way, it's most likely because you at some point, whether subliminally or intentionally decided to help yourself. And I know this because I've been there because my anger and frustration at engaging with this population is because I know exactly how many of you feel. I was also a loser who struggled socially and couldn't make sense of the opposite sex. As I've said before, if the red pill had existed in 2001, I'd have definitely fell into it for a point in time because I was misogynistic and bitter and entitled. And I thought I was a nice guy, but I wasn't. And I actually managed to get a few girlfriends and even get married before fully beginning to unpack the ways that patriarchy was causing me harm and contributing to the harm that I cause other people. And it was self-induced intentional growth over time, along with support and experiencing life that helped me grow and change. And it definitely helped that there weren't algorithmically optimized bubbles on social media to keep me sucked into Red Pill Podcast. But there also wasn't bread too. There also wasn't Jason Wilson or positive masculinity content to help me out either. I had to do it on my own and with resources that I'll come back to in a second. The key though, is that I admitted to my role in the equation and made it an active goal to grow and understand I'm still not done. All of this will be an ongoing process because brace yourself. We live in a patriarchy. We live in a world where fresh and fit can shit on women all the way to the bank for three years and only get punished for something other than misogyny. Mm. To end, I return to the statement I made in that men. previous video. To what will we do about men? Say that if you care about men and boys, your efforts and energy are best used to contribute to systemic and structural changes, along with providing as much social support as you can to the boys in your life and amplifying and engaging with the ideas and content that you think serves that purpose. As hard as I have worked to be the still very flawed man that I am today, so much of it is contingent on having access to education, healthcare, and a decent career. Things that many boys and men who are vulnerable to the red pill do not have. Intention can only go so far without structural support. Don't try to debate your little friend out of the red pill. He didn't get there due to strong arguments and strong arguments are likely not going to lead him out instead. And I know this is going to sound bad to some of you don't cut your red pill friend off, show them unconditional love and support that doesn't hinge on them being the right type of men, help them navigate a world they are struggling to make sense of and expose them to useful images and messages that they are actually ready for. You all are making me exhausted with this shit. The side channel was supposed to be 
goofy hot takes and pop culture and that's what we'll be returning <laughs> to as soon as possible i'm fd signifier and this has been light work oh my god this video is sponsored by i can't believe he's like talking about fresh and fit for light work light work oh my god <laughs> only fd i love that man my name's Ellis, welcome back to my channel. A few weeks ago I was kind of lost on the internet and I found this video that I wanted to show you. It's a collection of street interviews conducted in 1975. The question was very simple, do you know that women get beaten up? Or do you know any battered women? And this is what these men answered. Jesus. What a fucking question. Holy fuck. I guess street interviews are not so new, huh? Good lord. En ce moment, des femmes battues. Ça, je l'ignore totalement. I have no clue about that, but it's certainly not a new phenomenon. Mais yes, on y a certainement eu depuis toujours. <laughs> depuis le monde est monde. Since the beginning of times, women have ruled the world, you know. I think that it was... Uh, wait. Women have ruled the world, what? I think that it it was you should expect what I think that it was you should expect from relationships stuff what the fuck is going on in France between human beings you know battered women sounds odd wouldn't know anything about that I don't know anything about battered women. Yeah, these guys definitely beat women. And if I told you that I beat up my wife to force her to be kinder, Jesus Christ, and more in love with me, what would you think about that? More in love with me? Yo, what the fuck? And, uh, what do you think about it? Well, let's say if I beat up my wife, she's better in bed. Uh... Holy fuck, France. Lock up the entire nation. What the fuck is going on over there? What the fuck? It comes down to men's old patriarchal status. I mean... I guess that's true. It is the patriarchy. I don't think he means it like that. For a lot of people, this seems like common sense. But others are completely incapable of questioning. That a woman is also a human being. As I said, this... Pepe love you ass motherfuckers, yeah. This video was published in 1975, and I remember the first time I watched it that I was struck by how familiar those types of dances sound. Yikes. So we had a guy that basically says that women rule the world. It was only 10 years after married women were allowed to have their own bank account and work without their husband's consent. Then you have those who say that they are not aware of the fact that women get beaten up. I don't do that. And then you have the intellectual that casually explains that women are human beings and should be treated as such. Now this interview is what is called a man on the street interview, I'm not teaching you anything. It is a genre of feature of the world of journalism that is deeply appreciated because it allows the audience to get an idea of what average people like the ones watching TV, uh, the ones reading the newspapers, what those people think. The spontaneity of the interview is supposed to ensure that what the interviewee says is authentic. They didn't get a chance to really think about the question and the answer, like that man who was seen 3.5 million times saying on TV that he has slapped his wife in the face several times. He probably later regretted being so open about it. Street yeah. interviews are meant <laughs> to break the verticality of journalism where, what? you know, 
the Why would you just admit that on television? Like, Jesus. Journalists and experts telling you what you're supposed to think about this or that event. So it makes sense that this genre of videos has exploded on social media, which are supposed to give a voice to everybody to be a sort of public forum. I honestly can't go on YouTube or any other social media platforms without being recommended straight into views. I enjoy watching some of them because I believe it is interesting to hear what apolitical uh, people think about a given topic, but at the same time, I always take what is said with a grain of salt. Why? Because how can one person's lived experience be representative of any general truth? Have you ever heard about the Dunning-Kruger effect? It's a cognitive bias whereby people with low ability, Classic. expertise or experience regarding a type of task or area of knowledge tend to overestimate their ability or knowledge. When the guy in the 1975 street interview I showed you earlier said, women rule the world, well, he's doing the thing. He's overestimating his knowledge on a topic he's quite ignorant about. On the other hand, those who are quite knowledgeable on a given topic tend to underestimate themselves because they understand how demanding it is to be an expert. The Dunning-Kruger effect could be summed up in two sentences. The first one is, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. Socrates said it himself, quote, all I know is that I know nothing. And the second sentence could be, the less you know, the less you know that you don't know. The Dunning-Kruger effect makes so much sense when you look at street interviews on YouTube, social media in general, because Real. those interviews are full of people who overestimate their knowledge on this or that topic. Because what is important is not accuracy, but rather the production of content. Provocative, clickbait content, conveyed with enough confidence. Now, it is interesting to know about the Dunning-Kruger effect, but it doesn't change anything to the fact that street interviews have- Just Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Something experts who write for PubMed, Routledge or Oxford handbook collections don't have. They appeal to emotions, surprise, anger, joy, sadness. In turn, the emotional response of viewers is what gives the content legitimacy. You know, when you hear something that sounds right, that sounds true, something that generates a strong emotion of validation or rejection, you'll want to turn that emotion into a like, a comment. Now, the more people share that same emotional response, the more likes and comments uh, the post will get, and the more it appears legitimate. Now, that's precisely what people mean when they use the phrase common sense. Common sense does not require an in-depth analysis of a given topic with facts and stats. It just sounds right. Some have turned common sense into a political agenda. They purposely put facts on the side to promote their own vision of the world. As an example, far-right candidates often turn to common sense to compensate for the shortcomings in their political programs. They'll use what we call in France fait divers, meaning news that can trigger a strong emotional response like, let's say, a young white girl murdered by an Algerian woman or a police officer severely injured by a protester. So things that are quite unusual, let's be honest, to make generalizations and establish their truth. SES Suzanne Sontag dedicated an entire essay to the way images and videos can be misused. Mm. She defines the image as something on photography. Wonderful, wonderful book. Something that takes complex situations and simplify them into something that can be consumed in an instant. She did not reject images and videos as means of communication and information, but she made sure that they were backed with actual facts. My social media feed is full of videos of wildfires, of typhoons, so natural catastrophes that create a strong emotional response, um, namely fear. But those images that Emotional response is legitimate because there are facts, there are studies to prove that what is happening is real, is the result of climate change and that we need to do something about it. So to sum it up, street interviews rely on spontaneity, strong emotions and common people knowledge to establish the truth. It is based on the idea that each individual has an almost innate, therefore unbiased capacity to understand what is right and what is wrong. So that's one way of understanding the world we live in through images and individual experiences. However, the reason why we have evolved to become what we are today is that we have developed ways of knowing that put the individual experience into perspective. The scientific method is one example of that. But scientific research is not the only way of knowing. Okay, imagine a scientist who goes out to tell a small farmer that this product, this pesticide, is scientifically proven to be the best product possible to get rid of parasites and ensure long-term improvements with crops. The farmer will certainly agree, I mean, look at all those graphs and numbers, they seem pretty legit. 
But he knows by experience that this type of product will make his land infertile in the matter of a decade. And so he refuses to use the pesticide. By doing so, he uses his expertise as owner of the land, as an indicator of truth. All of that to say that without peer-reviewed scientific research, without expertise, we'd struggle to make sense of the world and ensure our long-term survival and development. So common sense, um, scientific research or expertise, well, some people believe there's another way to achieve truth, and that is debate. Debate merges scientific knowledge and emotion-based discourses. People like Ben Shapiro and debate bros in general have established a culture in which winning a debate equals being the possessor of truth. And I guess it makes sense in a way because the person who wins a debate is likely to have shown that the arguments of their opponent are wrong. But at the same time, there are so many elements that come into debating. The looks of the person, their gender, their level of self-confidence, how eloquent they sound. And because of all of that, the arguments put forward are sometimes neglected. In other words, debate culture is not always about being right, but rather about owning the other person. And also, it is still very centered on emotions. So, we started with street interviews and we ended up exploring the... the debate bros are the worst. It's true. Nobody likes a debate bro. Different ways uh, in which people seek truth. A majority of people understand that science and expertise are the preferred path to achieve truth. But some still get caught by the emotional appeal of common sense street interviews and spectacular debates. I mean, this sort of content perfectly fits with the demands of the attention economy. Left-wing critics or content, on the other hand, tend to push for a structural vision of society, detached from individual experiences, and that requires explanations, that requires time and effort, and taking a distance from one's emotions. In other words, it is not compatible with the attention economy. So the question now is, should we, as progressive people who want to convince others to join our causes, should we work with the attention economy, meaning with emotions and common sense? It's something I think about a lot, you know, um, not street interviews, but the role of emotions in politics. In French, we'd use the term affect, to be affected by something. According to philosopher Spinoza, affect can increase or diminish one's capacity to act. By that he meant that throughout our lives, we are affected by human interactions that can empower us, that can be a productive conversation with a friend, a speech, all conversations, interactions that can make us feel worse less. That is, for example, uh, bullying, being harassed by a boss, etc. Affects are really powerful and when they are coupled with ideas, they can move mountains. French intellectual François Bégodeau came to the conclusion that rationality cannot compete with effects. According to him, the left is losing because it is not working on developing a regime of effects that is stronger than the ones that already exist. In his book, Notre Joie, Our Joy, Bégodeau tells the story of a fan as he introduced himself, who invited him to get a drink and Happen to ha Wait, I'm not sure I understand what FX mean. Wait, what did she say? Where was it? According to philosopher Spinoza, affect would use the term affect to be affected by something. According to philosopher Spinoza, affect can increase or interact all conversations being harassed by a boss, etc. Affects are really powerful and when they are coupled with ideas, they can move mountains. French intellectual François Bégodeau came to the conclusion that rationality cannot compete with effects. According to him, the left is losing because it is not working on developing a regime of effects that is stronger than the ones that already exist. In his book, Notre Joie, Our Joy, Bégodeau tells the story of a fan as he introduced himself, who invited him to get a drink and happen to have far-right ideas. Bigodeau is known to be left-wing, by the way. Their discussions made Bigodeau realize that racism, misogyny, and other forms of diminishment of one's humanity lie in a powerful effect, almost an erotic effect of subordination. He believes that no rational discourse can fight against that. E erotic? Only more powerful counter-effects can. Let me give you another example, inspired by philosopher Simone Weil. In the fight against discrimination of all sorts, liberal democracies have institutionalized human rights in the language of rational laws. That means that we legally force individuals to see others as human beings. We have regulated or forbidden the expression of negative effects, like racism, sexism, homophobia, in the hope of cancelling them forever. But we haven't cancelled them. They remain. 
They express themselves in more insidious ways, in metaphors, in coded languages, dog wrestle. Someone like Begodo might say that we have lost the effects war. We haven't been able to find a strong enough counter effect and resorted to the justice system instead. That is partly true. I say partly because it'd be wrong to say that we haven't tried to forge counter effects. Sorority is one example. It seeks to empower women and resist patriarchy. So the problem isn't so much that we don't have positive counter effects. We do have a lot of them. The problem is that affects our conditions by the society we live in. As philosopher and economist Frédéric Lordon explains, quote, there are individuals and they experience effects on an individual level, but those effects are nothing else than the effect of the structures in which individuals are immersed. In a society, our society, that is based on- We live in a society. Classification, subordination and power, it is not surprising that acts of racism, misogyny, homophobia create this sort of erotic effect. They make the racist, misogynist or homophobe powerful, edgy, and we can make him come in just a few seconds. It's really, really powerful. Joke society, that is why the phrase common sense is more often used by conservatives than by progressives. Common sense appeals to biases that comply with the structures of the societies we live in. Now, looking back on history, there have been times where it felt like the tables turned. In 1776, Thomas Paine published Common Sense, a pamphlet directed at common people of the colonies and advocating independence from Great Britain. It was sold, distributed, or even read aloud in taverns and meeting places. It asserted that common sense is firmly on the side of the people, but historian Sophia Rosenfeld showed that the pairing of, quote, common sense and republican governance as anything more than wishful thinking or rhetorical masterstroke on the part of pain. For most of history, and indeed even in North America in early um, 1776, the opposite was surely the case. The direct rule of the people was deemed an obvious recipe for disorder, instability, and worse. End of the quote. More recently, uh, François Ruffin, the rising star of the French left, has been reappropriating common sense and effects to push for progressive values. He regularly tells the story of working class people um, and the oppression they face on a daily basis to appeal to listeners' emotions. I'm smiling because it has become a bit of a meme, to be honest. Now, it's difficult to measure if this strategy is successful, but he is determined to win back the working class electorate who turned to the far right in the past decade. So that leaves us with one last question. Can positive counter-effects revolutionize society? Or do we need an entirely new system for those effects to grow? I tend to be quite skeptical about the let's fight back with their tools strategy. So the strategy used by Thomas Paine, by François Ruffin, because, you know, reappropriation can be emancipatory, but deep down I feel like it only legitimizes the tools of the other side as a basis from which we can organize our own fight. What I mean is that, as we established, that common sense is a valid basis from which to draw popular support, from which to establish truth. Then we have to accept that others do it and that they might be better at it than us. Instead, I sincerely believe that we have to find new ways to galvanize people, to get their attention. Adopting the other side's strategy doesn't sound like a good idea. It's reactive, it's not proactive. In a similar way, hoping that people will anonymously separate effects from rational thoughts is ambitious and maybe not something we should desire. I mean, remaining unaffected and 100% rational all the time sounds a bit boring. It sounds a bit too centrist for me. We do not want a world dictated by Excel documents and PowerPoints, don't we? So no, I don't have a specific idea of what we'd need to do, but that is precisely when imagination comes into play. Philosopher Simone Weil talked about a higher good um, positioned above the individual, a sort of secular gods that would guide our actions to favour collective well-being over the defence of individual interests. By the way, I didn't talk about religion as a way to achieve truth, but of course it's something that people have used and continue to use for that purpose. Vale is inspired by that in a way, but she makes it secular, she detaches it from an institution, um, you know, it's not incarnated by a person or an animal. Others think about how to change the organization of space, to see if it also changes uh, people's relationships with one another for the better, to see if it changes the effects to which they respond positively. That's the philosophy behind the 15 minute city or the Z, Zona Defend, which are spaces occupied by climate activists, especially anarchists, that look like little villages. I mean, many things can be done at various levels, local to international, including your own imaginative brain level. So, 
turning to doomism doesn't make any sense. Now I'm really curious to hear if you've ever thought about those ideas and what you think we should do to spread progressive values in a way that doesn't become elitist, but also in a way that doesn't legitimize um, the strategies of our opponents. I'll continue to think and talk about all of that as well. I'm very conscious that video essays aren't accessible to everyone and that they can sound a bit elitist due to the language we use, etc. But keep in mind that the concepts and ideas I presented in this video already simplified and arranged in a way that makes sense in our modern world. But yeah, the video isn't an end in itself, it's rather like a question mark, uh, and you can provide answers by taking the ideas articulated here and turn them into something that makes even more sense for you and the people around you. I like the idea of working on different levels, and I don't think that those videos are less effective than, let's say, going door to door to convince people to join a political campaign. I feel like some work better with abstract ideas and concepts that they then materialize in concrete stuff like a poster or a movie or a local movement, and others better connect with an idea when it makes sense in their lives, so when it's very pragmatic. Convincing people then comes down to understanding what sort of discourse better work for them and providing that. As an example, it does not make sense to throw abstract concepts and ideas at someone who doesn't have a structural vision of society and on the other hand some need concepts to situate themselves and understand who they are, who we are. So yeah I guess that's it for today, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as always the conversation continues in the comment section, don't forget to like, to subscribe if it's not already done. I would like to thank my patrons for their support and a special thank to top tier patrons Joey, Ivan, Jason, Trebizonde, Corrigi, Rémi, Tristan, Patricia, Christopher, Ian, Donage, Alex, Edwin, Ren, Sam, Manuel, Alexi, Benjamin and Perry. Now, yeah, I'll see you very soon. Salut! So I have the list of top tier patrons there and Camilla Cabello was one of them. She has been supporting the channel for a very long time now, but I've just discovered that she's not a patron anymore and I know, that makes me a little bit sad. My theory is that Sean Mendes is behind that. Don't you just love when you go into making a video thinking that it's going to be simple and straightforward and then it instantly spirals into something much, much more complicated than anticipated? No, just me, little YouTuber things. Uh, I started off this video specifically researching a guy apparently known as Jamie Reynolds. First I saw him in this photo and I was like, what is his deal? But more importantly than the fact that I can't find hardly anything about this strange man is that he wasn't the only one doing this but this was apparently like a whole thing this was like jackass before jackass so let's explore this <laughs> as it turns out this story is wild apparently jammy reynolds wasn't unique at all in his daredevil habits from the early 1900s up until probably just about world war ii there was this huge trend of dudes who called themselves human flies, whose entire job was scaling buildings with just their hands and no equipment for pay. I don't know about you, but this seems absolutely unthinkable to me. Maybe it's because I was born without any sort of proclivity for danger and I'm not even a huge fan of roller coasters. I'm very much risk averse. <laughs> However, much like people's instinct to rubberneck at car accidents or oogle at train crashes, as I discussed in my video on the Victorian obsession with recreational train crashes, people really got a kick out of watching these dudes risk their lives to scale these random buildings. Tens of thousands of people at a time even. So of course these guys are the ancestors of modern day daredevils, from guys getting shot out of cannons or driving motorcycles over canyons or doing crazy stunts for internet clout or the ever popular Jackass series. It goes back much, much further than I ever thought it would, and actually says a lot about the social history of masculinity itself, and how all of that changed in the late Victorian era when societal ideas of the gender construct were beginning to be in flux. Jamie Reynolds was not the only human fly, but rather one of many. A swarm, you could say. <laughs> Come learn with me about dudes scaling buildings for cash, some of whom died gruesome deaths, and the history of great daredevil spectacles. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor, Wayfair. Human 
Flies weren't the only men to make a career out of doing death-defying stunts, nor were they even the first. Many thrill-seeking acts came long before them, like for instance Steve Brody, the man who became famous for surviving his jump from the Brooklyn Bridge in 1886, although it's also likely that most of his jumps in his career were faked using a dummy. And then long before Brody, there was a man named Sam Patch, who in 1827 jumped over the newly built Passaic Falls in New Jersey. Patch's jump, in that the falls were built to power the factory mills where Patch worked, was emblematic of slowly shifting ideals of masculinity. Paul E. Johnson writes in Sam Patch, The Famous Jumper, In Patch's world, a man's art was his identity-defining skill. The whole range of combined mental and manual performances, by means of which trained men provided for the wants and needs of their communities, it called up the yeoman artisan republic and ideals of manhood that it sustained. Ideals that Sam Patch and other working men had reformulated and extended into the industrial world of the 19th century. Patch would go on to earn widespread fame for his jumps, leading to an incredibly famous one from Niagara Falls in 1829. But we'll get into more of these daredevils later. The point is, from the very beginning, doing these dangerous stunts was magnetic for men because it was a way to express their masculinity. Whereas, by Victorian standards, the same could not be said for women. A woman, of course, could partake in stunts, and many of them did, but it wasn't remotely a way for them to assert or reinforce their gender the way that it was for men. As we'll see, dominating skyscrapers with nothing but their hands, human flies were speaking to a new form of heroic masculinity where manhood was a spectacle or theater. These stunts would draw crowds of hundreds or thousands huddling below in squinting upwards in awe and horror, knowing full well that they might watch a man die today. And if he didn't, he would earn fame and glory, likely even a career. Jacob Smith writes in The Thrillmakers, The performers spoke to audiences about shifting conceptions of masculinity. Manhood, according to Gail Betterman, is best seen as a continual dynamic process, and that at every point in history, multiple and often contradictory ideas about manhood are available to explain what men are, how they want to behave, and what sorts of powers and authorities they claim as men. Irving Goffman argues that gender, like all social roles, is something achieved through socially and historically determined interaction, and he defines conventionalized appearances and behaviors meant to indicate a gendered self as gender displays. The thrillmakers were specialists in action framed as gender display, and their actions reflected and refracted tensions and ambiguities in the ideologies of American manhood. And and it should be noted, most of these thrill seekers weren't upper class men. They were working class and frequently had a history with whatever thing that they were trying to conquer, or they were trying to create a career out of doing stunts, or they were trying to promote a business that they ran. More often than not, Professional thrill seekers spoke to a shifting type of working class manliness that manifested not through social propriety and money empires, but instead through physical feats using their bodies to dominate grand man-made structures. That's where human flies come into play. If there's any image in your mind of silent films, odds are it may be the famous shot of Harold Lloyd clinging to a broken clock on a tall building in Safety Last 1923. In this scene, Lloyd was cleverly referencing a phenomenon that has been almost entirely forgotten in popular memory, but from the 1900s through the 1930s was an extremely popular line of public stunt work. Human flies, also referred to as human spiders, human lizards, steeplejacks, builderers, stegophilers, and so on. The phenomenon of human flies was so integral to the inspiration for Safety Last that the film paid one, a man named Harry Young, to climb the Martinique Hotel in New York with a Safety Last promo banner on his back. Young tragically fell from the hotel and died during the climb, a morbidly on the nose thing to happen considering the title of the film. But this incident isn't just notable because of the tragedy. It's a solid representation of a wide number of factors that made up the human fly craze in the first place. Its roots lie in the Regency period when stealing walkers at circuses would use various mechanisms to simulate walking on the ceiling or on beams. And the term steeplejack comes from the actual job of the same name. Men who would scale and repair or build tall structures like church steeples and chimneys. But the first written record of actual stegophily, so far as we can tell, comes in 1901 from The Roof Climber's Guide to Trinity, 
written by Jeffrey Winthrop Young, explaining how you can climb up the Trinity College spires as he did in 1895. The book was more satire than something to be taken seriously, even though the guy literally did do that. But jokes aside, there was a real glimmering draw for men to go climb Big Tower. As the Industrial Revolution led to the skyward growth of buildings taller than ever before, there came men who sought to conquer them the same as if they were mountains. And, of course, with the rise of marketing and advertising as mass media spread, these stunts proved to be an extremely effective way to promote something or sell a product, much like how Young was promoting Safety Last when he fell to his death. One of the most famous human flies, a man named Harry Gardner, who often claimed to be the original, but frankly, a lot of these dudes did, took advertising sponsors for nearly every climb that he did. Whether it was promoting an ad office, or commemorating a new building, or selling beaver oil, there was typically money involved. Sometimes it was as simple as passing a hat around the crowd to collect tips while he did his climb, and for others they would make religious or political speeches before climbing. Either way, it became fairly profitable for human flies to travel the country doing climbs for pay, and some, like Jamie Reynolds, would donate to charity. Speaking of Jamie Reynolds, let's get back to him. This dude was doing the most. He didn't stop at scaling buildings like Spider-Man, oh no. He would also do tricks at the top, like balancing on several chairs over the edge, and doing handstands or like climbing up on the flagpole and planking on it. What a legend. <laughs> I couldn't find much biographical info on this guy, but apparently he started doing handstands as a toddler and was doing stunts ever since. It seems that he was simply born without fear. As he once said, I only get inspired over 30 stories. <laughs> Another totally buckwild human fly was a man named Nutty Jack Williams, who allegedly had a grip so strong he could support his entire body weight with one finger and squeeze a raw potato into a pulp. Another reporter claimed that his fingers were Ayo? Ayo? That's a gorilla grip. More like steel claws than bone and flesh. He started his career as a trapeze artist where he rescued a girl who was stuck in a high rise that was on fire and too tall for the fire truck ladders, so he climbed up the side of the building with his hands and carried her down to safety. He then decided that simply was not deadly enough and decided to go climb stuff like the Woolworth Building with, according to the New York Journal in 1918, the agility of an ape. He climbed up the Washington Monument, he climbed up the Waldorf Hotel with a bodacious babe clinging to his back like he was King Kong, he claimed to have climbed everything in the Legend. country with a smooth face. After the 20s, he disappeared from the press, apparently, but turns out he actually went and started a circus, according to his son, John Frazier. He spent the Great Depression moving from odd job to odd job and taught his children circus tricks. One human fly was also nicknamed the Unkillable Actor. Rodman Law started his climbing career by by conquering the Flatiron Building in 1909 to win a bet and went on to do a number of creative movie stunts. Advertising one of his upcoming films, the motion picture news magazine declared, You've heard of Rodman Law, the man who was shot from a huge gun high into the air. The man who stood on his head on the ball which tips the flagpole at the Singer Building. The man who climbed the side of the Flatiron Building with his bare hands. The man who has defied death a hundred times. Rodman Law, the calculating daredevil who has thrilled millions by his mad recklessness in performing seemingly impossible stunts. So he's a pretty good example of just how intertwined the human flies were with the movie business and advertising and also how these dudes could get conscripted to do other non-climbing stunts. But Harry Gardner was arguably the most famous one of all. Frequently claiming to be the first human fly, Gardner got his start in 1905 and successfully climbed over 700 buildings during his career. He frequently drew tens of thousands of spectators, one time even getting a crowd of 150,000 in 1916 when he climbed the Majestic Building. He was so popular that even companies not sponsoring his climbs would use him to sell their products in newspaper ads, but tragically, in the 1920s, he mysteriously disappeared. One rumor says he was found beaten to death beneath the Eiffel Tower, but we'll never know for sure. Not all human flies were so successful. George Oakley earned some notoriety from a stunt where he was strapped into a straitjacket and freed himself while hung upside down from his feet from the Hagerstown First National Bank building, then climbed down the building, and then back up to the roof. <laughs> Oakley was climbing the Chambersburg Trust building when he fell three stories to the ground, 
and broke pretty much every bone in his body. Some other flies earned unique nicknames, like John Ciampa, who became known as Brooklyn Tarzan, and still others weaponized the danger of their job to incite shock and excitement from the onlookers. George Poli, who started climbing buildings when a shopkeeper told him he'd give him a free suit if he successfully climbed the store, once scaled the Woolworth building and scared the shit out of the crowd by occasionally pretending to slip. Oh, the lovable scamp. Unfortunately, he didn't make it to the top before getting arrested, but don't ask me how the cops got him. I have no idea. I like to imagine they were climbing up after him, Looney Tunes style though. <laughs> but the cops had real reason to want to stop human flies from scaling buildings. Not only did they often cause damage to the building edifices or died, but sometimes they even took onlookers to the grave with them. One fly in 1929 tried to climb Chicago's Lyric Opera House, but slipped and fell 23 stories to his death, crashing on top of two young messenger boys. One of the boys sustained critical injuries and the other died. Technically speaking, the human fly trend only faded out but didn't actually disappear. This is due in part to the ever-increasingly dangerous height and build of new skyscrapers. These new tall boys are too smooth, too flat, or oddly shaped. It's simply too dangerous. That doesn't stop folks from trying, though. In 1977, George Willig climbed the World Trade Center. In 1981, Dan Goodwin, often dubbed Spider Dan, <laughs> climbed the Sears Tower. And another time, he scaled the John Hancock building. French Spider-Man Elaine Roberts takes his shot at stupidly tall buildings, too, like the Burj Khalifa and the Eiffel Tower. People were less impressed in 2008 when he tried climbing the New York Times building because, as one annoying cop said, it already looks like a ladder. Okay, you go climb it then. <laughs> but in the end, if trends like parkour and whatever nonsense is probably going on over on TikTok when I'm not looking is proof of anything, it's that one thing is certain. No, three things are certain. Death, taxes, and that men will never overcome the deep hunger within their souls to go climb tall thing like monkey. be remiss to not mention the interwoven history of stuntmen here. Many human flies went on to become movie stuntmen, the actors conscripted to double as the headlining film star and do whatever dangerous thing that the star couldn't do, jumping off a building or across a train or getting knocked through a window. And worst of all, they had to keep their role secret because the Hollywood fantasy often sold the idea of these big stars like Douglas Fairbanks doing their own stunts. It was described in the Saturday Evening Post by one stuntman as an unforgivable sin for a stuntman to break the illusion by taking credit for his own work. This caused a great deal of friction between stuntmen and leading men, especially because the stuntmen were also expected to literally verbally back these lies up a lot of the time. The guy from the SCP article went on, I'm the mystery man of the movies, the skeleton in the star's closet. Though I performed under the aliases of 30 different stars, you've never read my name as a cast credit. Socially, I'm poison, and stars resent the suggestion that they even know me. Yet, they can't get along without me. I wear their clothes, I ride their horses, I sail their boats, I fly their planes, for I am the man that they are supposed to be. I am the one individual Hollywood can't take as a joke, the one embarrassing relation they can't laugh off, that unpopular stepbrother of the stars, the devil. Many of these stars would regale breathtaking stories of the death-defying risks that they took for their films, even showing photos of said stunts where it wasn't even them in the photo, but their stuntman. There's yet another gender angle to this too, in that since most stuntmen were, well, men, they were therefore conscripted to be the body doubles for female stars. If you see an actress doing a stunt in an early film, odds are it's a man wearing her costume. That's not to say that women never did stunts. Actually, a lot of them did. Women have a long history of being circus performers, and with the invention of the airplane, new doors opened up for women to show off their skills. One of these women was Lillian Boyer. She was working as a waitress in 1921, when one day a couple of customers invited her to ride in an airplane, something that she had wanted to do for so long, so of course she took the offer. One airplane ride later, she climbed onto the wings of the plane and soon enough began training with Lieutenant Billy Brock and learned how to do aerial stunts and wing walking. She did over 352 aerial performances until 1928 when new government regulations passed 
forcing aerial stunts like these to become a thing of the past. Unfortunately, sometimes wild animals got involved in stunts. Not surprising, considering the background and circus acts that many of these things had, but still. One particularly dangerous animal act involved training lions to sit in sidecars and be driven in circles around the Wall of Death, which is exactly what it looks and sounds like. Makes for some hilarious photos, but shocking nobody, this was not a fun time for the lions, and some of them managed to escape and maul bystanders to death, so. Let's not be involving wild large predators in carnival acts, please. Now, I'm sure when thinking of daredevils, proper looking old lady Victorian school teachers is not what comes to mind first, but Annie Edson Taylor at the age of 63 in 1901 was indeed a daredevil and a school teacher. It was that year that she became the first person to survive going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, setting off over a century of barrel jokes. Annie was struggling financially, and seeing the success of stunt kings like the Barnum and Bailey Circus Acts, she thought that surviving an incredible stunt could fix her money woes. So she hopped in a barrel of her own design and went careening over the falls that had taken so many lives and survived. She became an instant celebrity nicknamed the Goddess of the Water. Unfortunately, the success was short-lived and the money was even shorter. She died in poverty in 1921, much like many other thrill-seekers of the era. Possibly because, unlike other thrill-seekers, she never had any desire to replicate the stunt that made her famous. She told the Globe, I would rather face a cannon than go over the falls again. Speaking of stunts that entered cartoon canon, and speaking of cannons, we've all seen some show or movie that shows a guy being shot out of a cannon. Maybe you've played the greatest game ever made, Zoo Race, in which the animals from Noah's Ark get shot out of cannons and go to the moon. Well, yes, dudes really did get shot out of cannons. The first being William Leonard Hunt, nicknamed the Great Farini in 1871. He invented a cannon he called the Projector, made out of springs and rubber and a platform. A person would be shot out of it with gunpowder poofs for effect. Following him, the Australian Marvels, Ella Zuila and George Loyal did an act in 1872 where George got launched out of a cylinder that looks like a cannon and would be caught by his partner who was hanging upside down on a trapeze. Six years later, a 14-year-old named Rossa Matilda Richter, or Zazel, redid the stunt in London and went on to join P.T. Barnum's circus. Moving on to more recent times, I don't know about you, but when I think of the word daredevil, the first thing that actually comes to mind is dudes doing long distance motorcycle jumps. In particular, ones at the Grand Canyon or some other big crevice. <laughs> Many have attempted wild stunts at the Grand Canyon, usually on the part that belongs to the Hualapai Nation. And in 1999, Robbie Nival drove his motorcycle 228 feet through the air over the canyon. His father, Abel, was a famous moto jumper too. Look at him go. This is probably the guy that most people picture when they imagine motorcycle jumps. And then in 2008, of course, there's Robbie Madison, who did this highly publicized jump in Vegas. But possibly one of the most dangerous daredevil feats in history is this jump from the edge of space done in 2012 by skydiver Felix Baumgartner, which was played years later as an ad for the Super Bowl. Felix miraculously lived to tell the tale, but it only makes you wonder. What's next? It's easy to wonder why all these people wanted to do these risky things in the first place, especially in a time period when it was so, so much easier to die from lack of adequate medical care. And thrill-seeking behavior, of course, didn't start with human flies or cliff jumpers or even circus acts. You had the Roman gladiators, 13th century bull runners, 6th century Chinese hang gliders, and many, many more. People have always felt an urge to experience risky excitement, to push the boundaries of what is possible for the human body, to defy death. When speaking to an adrenaline junkie named Mike, psychologist Kenneth Carter was told, I have no interest in dying skydiving. It's actually way safer than getting in your car and driving to work. What I have is a kind of addiction to life, for lack of a better word. I think it's not a disregard for life, but an addiction to life and trying to intensify moments instead of dole them out. People who do these wild stunts and thrill-seeking activities don't do it because they've got a death wish, they do it because they want to feel life at its most vivid, to touch the boundaries of experiencing the world. 
So you see, from the time of human flies garnering tens of thousands of onlookers, watching them scale buildings, to now, over a century later, when TV and the internet has brought ever more daring feats to the eyes of millions, people will always seek bigger and bigger thrills, and will always love watching them, a little fearful, and a little envious. Thank you for learning with me about the history of daredevils and their hunger for danger. Have you ever done any thrill-seeking activities? Bungee jumping? Skydiving? If so, why do you do it? Let me know in the comments. And until next time, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and wear thy parachute. For no, for no reason at all. Two years of my life. 1.6 million followers. All because enough people spam reported my account because they don't like me over some- Hashtag oh homeless. Oh my god. What is going on? He's like screaming. <laughs> then that wasn't even true. I know you already want to scroll and you have a super short attention span. This fucking, what is this shot I'm looking at with your foot? And so, I mean, if you're watching his video up until this point, like Ethan and I are, there is still the suspicion that like, hey, maybe he is right. This kid seems very distressed. It seems like he's being as honest as he can be. That does not end up being the case. It really does not. And I, and I think that this is why I ended up deciding to show this video to you all, because it sincerely is like like an artifact in internet history it is wild i'll explain it as quickly as i can a while back i called a girl cute and it turned out that she was 17. whoa he's playing with his ring man so i'll explain it as quickly as i can a while back i called a girl cute and it turned out that she was 17 and everyone started calling me a pet file i started getting hundreds of death threats on instagram people started stitching and duetting and flooding my comments saying that i like kids and no one even bothered to ask how old i am i'm 19. <laughs> I'm dude i what is going on see what's crazy is my my parents friend their mom and dad have a 15 year age gap because they were adults it doesn't count it's just weird that this is wild that we just fell into this this rabbit hole this is a four and a half minute long video someone goes dog i know i'm the maid outfit girl but anyways hope your career goes to the better prayers, prayers. <laughs> i'm fresh out of high school i graduated last year the girl that i complimented is less than two years younger than me and more than that, even the, all I did was call her cute. And even then, the Romeo and Juliet law is in play. I am like, <laughs> what is going on? This is wild. This is so wild to me. That only counts for like an existing relationship, I think. So, so far what we know is that this guy, the tall knight, which is a TikTok user who is like known for being this like sexy night guy. He's a sexy night that makes like sexy night videos. So now he's freaking out because apparently he called a 17 year old girl cute. That's what he's telling us. And that's why he got banned. And he's 19, the Romeo and Juliet laws. Yeah, I wanna hear him finish that sentence. <laughs> this, okay, that, wow. Even the, all I did was call her cute. And even then, the Romeo and Juliet law is in play where I live. So even, even, even then, it's not even illegal. But now my life is ruined because now that I'm banned, the amount of money that I made from views, that was gonna pay my rent. But now that I'm banned, I'll never see a penny of it. All because of something that wasn't even fucking true. What? This is crazy. Dude, 
Why <laughs> is he like filming his feet so much? I just like make a video. Cannot <laughs> understand. This is like the worst way to try to get people on your side, dude. <laughs> Don't chuck the helmet across the room. <laughs> he's, he's just like throwing his helmet. He's showing his little piggies too much. Too much, dude. It's, too it's much. like he's trying to still promote this page. <laughs> Guys, we will. I want to. I can't wait to like figure that. We're doing some internet sleuthing right now, trying to figure out what's going on. This is insane. I've never seen anyone <laughs> respond. <laughs> He could have done this in the mask. He could have just recorded his well, face in the mask. And what's crazy is the next video is him being like, yeah, I got bit. <laughs> and this is like, ah! <laughs> He's like l throwing a tantrum. I'm like, dude, it's not, you can get it fixed. Like, just give it a second, man. Hashtag homeless. And then he's showing his room like that he's living in this homeless situation as if this didn't happen like a couple days like, ago. Literally just now. <laughs> it says the three days yeah, ago. three days ago. And now he's like chucking his shit across the room and he's screaming. Does he still have, I I am. Oh, no way, it's it's still in his link tree. Try my workout routine. <laughs> okay, so that's the age verification I'm assuming. For $5 a month, you can see his personal workout routine. Um, oh, and it looks he... like, oh, it looks like he took down the. The other tiers? The other tiers because big no-no so the youtube is where he actually talks about this is a bizarre thumbnail oh for the response God. video to you doing something wrong what the fuck? okay let's continue i this is like the craziest way i've seen someone respond to something like this nuts like it, i think he just immediately like made a new account and just but now that i'm banned i'll never see a penny of it all because of something that wasn't even true and now now here i am again here i fucking am again is he wearing pants <laughs> <laughs> wait no i think his sword disappeared he threw his helmet and bumped the sword did it fall over all because of something that wasn't even fucking true and now now I think here I am again. <laughs> Where did he, where did he the, put sword the sword fell the uh, sword fell on the ground can you the... see it on the ground did yeah yeah move it? No, no, no. Oh, and now, it now it. he's right oh, there. Now fully on the ground. Here I am again. Here I fucking am again, humiliated and having to oh, ask no, for help pants. again. Because enough people had it out for me. Enough people didn't bother to ask. Enough people hated blindly without asking simple questions just because they don't like me. Now I'm banned. Rent is due in 10 days and I won't... Wait, hold on. ...won't have the money to pay it because I... Your rent's due in 10 days. You're not, is he expecting a deposit from the TikTok fund, ten, creator fund? Did he just like, did, was his whole bank account destroyed? Like what? You've got 10 days. I don't think you were going to make it if this is the thing that broke you. Like you're not getting, like TikTok's not about to hit the bank account. Yeah, that doesn't add up. Unless he was literally waiting on like a huge payout that for some reason isn't happening because he got banned. Hashtag I need help. Hashtag, please don't scroll. I got banned, and I won't get the money from views that I would have needed. And now I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because there's, there's no way people are going to help me a second time. I don't know what I'm going to do. I finally, I finally had everything. I finally had enough money, barely enough money, to not go back to fast food. To finally live the life that I've been working towards. Like, to put it into perspective, I mean barely. I had just enough money to move in. I don't have- Where did he move from? I don't know. And why did you do that when you're a guy on TikTok who cosplays as a sexy knight? Yeah. Why, like, you shouldn't be- do That shouldn't be like, okay, I did it, time to move. Oh, wait, one thing happened and I'm not gonna get a check from TikTok? Oh. My whole life is, like, instantly? Like, like really that fast that's crazy it literally just <laughs> like literally has not had a chance to affect his life yet I have furniture my laundry sits on the ground i sleep there i don't have this is literally all i was able to bring with me the rest of my apartment is empty my tv out there is sitting on the ground all because enough people believe the stupid lie i don't think the tv's on the ground because people believed in a stupid lie he's showing this room like it's all, like his whole apartment but he was saying like my whole the rest of my apartment like this is <laughs> one room in an apartment even if it's a one bedroom like okay like this isn't making sense to me <laughs> without bothering to ask and i already know 
I already know. Enough people hate me so much. They're probably going to duet this video telling just random shit. They're just going to start making up new shit about me, saying that I deserve this. Who deserves this? So just... <laughs> Who deserves this? <laughs> and then the next fucking video. Yeah. Got banned. And so at this point, Ethan and I are still sleuthing. We're still trying to see what the story is. If we need to give this guy the benefit of the doubt or if there is some weird secret stuff going on here that we may not be getting from the tall knight. His claim is continuously that he called a 17 year old girl cute online and that's why he shouldn't have gotten banned because he, well, he's 19 so then like even though he, the R R romeo and juliet laws state that you know if you could still date a minor if you're within a certain you know year age from them of course which has nothing to do with the situation i don't think that covers comments online directed at minors i think this is more people saying that what he's doing is very suspect and odd and then him doubling down and in, in not taking any of the videos down made it even weirder and as people pointed out and as they will continue to point out the 17 year old thing is not what people are upset about people are upset with the way that he displayed his different social media pages funneling people who specifically are children to go see his not safe for work content and not really being careful in any sense about trying to protect the younger viewers and his audience from that. But as it seems, most of his audience is younger women who are children. I know I have no right. I know, I know you've already helped me once and I am so, so sorry to ask for help again. Otherwise I'm gonna end up homeless again and I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to go back. I don't want to do that again. So please, if, if, if you can't, if, if you, if I understand, trust me, I get it if you don't have money. So if you don't, please just share this video, like, repost, comment, whatever you can do, because I'm, I'm, I'm fucking 19. I don't know what I'm doing. This was, my content on TikTok was the only thing keeping me afloat, and now I've lost it, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Look, I know what I did. <laughs> oh man, come on. I oh, it's like it's like so hard to take seriously. It's hard to like watch someone, you know, panicking in this situation, but the fact that, that the the reasoning is because he cosplayed as a sexy a tall knight. Yeah, he wanted to be the tall knight for his job forever. And it's like I don't think we should I think regardless of the situation, this is a lesson in Maybe you shouldn't put all your eggs in, in, the a, in a character that is created out of a mask you bought on Amazon. I just think that's like, like this can't be all you have. Like you, <laughs> literally, your Patreon's still up. Yeah. You, nothing got taken down except for your TikTok, which well, I don't know where you were getting the money. Was stupid. This cut to like him sitting on the ground with a fist, defeated again, is like crazy. Me afloat, and now I've lost it, and I don't know what I'm gonna do. Look, I know what I did was stupid. I understand that. But if you can really- Oh my God! His face. He really gave the- Why would, after all of this, why would you give the face reveal? I don't know. This is how he reveals his face? That's crazy. Look me in the eyes and tell me that because I complimented someone less than two years younger than me, and that makes me a pedophile, that a two year age gap makes me a pedophile. I don't know. I don't know. This has to be one of the most bizarre responses to a controversy I've ever seen. Like straight up. I, I mean, it's this is like baffling and like deeply concerning for this person's mental health, truly. Yeah, like he should. I don't know why. This is not how anyone should be reacting to something like this happening in their life. Like this, there's a, there's a lot going on here. I think. Yeah. And so there's a lot of times in this video where I genuinely am like, okay, I think maybe this guy needs serious help. Maybe we need to be taking this more seriously because he's obviously calling out for help and he needs help from somebody and, and he seems like he's very isolated, even though he has a partner. But then the sister. 
I don't know. But the more we look into this, there are so many details that the tall knight willingly leaves out of his arguments until someone actually calls him out on it. And then by that time, he has another argument to back it up. He starts off by just saying, it was a 17 year old and he was a 19 year old and he commented one thing calling some girl cute had nothing to do with anything people were saying i didn't actually see any comments that were like the issue is that you said a 17 year old girl was cute no there were many other women and that was not the main claim that caused him to get banned at all but let's go before we come back to here i want to go back to the guy who originally we saw the TikTok of and see how yeah. his I, go back. I, wanna, I wanna see how he's been covering this. this. Like this video where you dance provocatively to a spicy song after one of your fans said they want to see it grow. And when you take two seconds to look at the girl who commented that, she is very clearly 15 years old. So, she was born in 2008, that's crazy. Yeah, that's insane. So that literally, already, that's not like, that's not what happened. Like he didn't just call a 17 year old girl cute. Yeah, so the tall knight, failed to address that but he did stitch this video yeah i guess i guess in the first one we've only watched his intro this is an obviously like you can see any of one of these tiktoks you're like oh this is a teenage girl yeah which if i think about like our content <laughs> just imagining even responding to any type of flirtatious comment is a little bizarre to a me a little strange especially knowing that there's a good chance those people could be underage you don't engage with that yeah if you want to post sexy shit you will do what you want but don't you're literally like marketing it towards that person like you, you made a video responding to a 15 year old they say they want to see it grow dude you can't do that and when people who were concerned about this confronted you you wouldn't even take down the video like this video where you announced you are now making adult content and this fan of yours is really excited and look you commented back to her and again two seconds to click the it profile literally she just says 13 i'm 13. <laughs> 13 years old tall knight directed all these people to his link tree and you see that link at the top that says my and he also has an openly yeah, spicy eight, twitter 18 plus twitter that he took down now that's not on his thing anymore which is like, if you're not promoting towards those people, then like, what, where do, who do you think you're directing? Like, if not the person you're responding you to. You literally responded to that person. <laughs> and like, you can find my porn, child. Yeah, nude pictures and dick pics. And then the bottom. Whimpering audios? <laughs> Without needing to verify your age at all. I'm sorry, you'll have to remind me. Is this the third or the fourth? fourth time you've duetted me trying to expose me only for me to duet you prove you wrong and for you to delete your video as usual these hilariously desperate accusations can be disassembled with basic logic so allow me to elaborate and i'll make this quick don't worry so to put it simply there is no nsfw content on my patreon and that's for one very simple reason patreon does not allow nsfw content but you was that a fake screenshot then? And the only reason these tiers exist there is because I was originally going to post it there. Why? Because Patreon only takes 12% of your income, whereas OnlyFans takes 20. So the only reason those tiers are there is because I was originally going to post stuff and they were only up for maybe two or three days, several weeks ago. And then they got taken down because they violated Patreon's guidelines. So, as usual, you are taking facts about my life out of context and attempting to make me look bad in front of your meat writing audience for views. The only thing I'm guilty of is seeing a sexualized comment and assuming the user was an adult. The fact that you would see a comment like that and automatically think of children is ten times more concerning. So, no, please, man. the next time you come after me, Damn. take more than two seconds to investigate what's going on before trying to make me look bad. Sorry, I don't, I like have to interrupt you. Allow me to elaborate. Oh, shiver me timbers. So to put it simply, there is no NSFW content on my Patreon. Yes, because you deleted it. Does this look familiar, Tall Knight? Did you not think I would have the receipts for it? Wait. So he did post shit on his actual Patreon. Just off NSFW videos? 
Like, he literally put links up to that stuff on his own page. Whimpering audio. Is what the fuck is win What is that? Is he going to play it? I, I will lose I my mind it. if he does. I hope he plays it. Oh my god. Oh my god. I have all the videos, all the photos, and all the audios from before you deleted them. <laughs> this is crazy. You can lie and cover your tracks all you want, but you marketed oh, and, and sold this stuff to children. So, do I, should we, we just go watch here? that one because it's chronological? Yes, because you deleted it. Does this look familiar, Tom? Professor, I deadass used to respect you, but this is just sad. How many times are you going to take things out of context to try to make me look bad? Because you're right, that post was still on my Patreon as of last Thursday. But a very important detail here is the fact that you couldn't even open it. Because literally almost a month ago, they violated guidelines and got flagged. Okay, but that's <laughs> different than not posting content, which is what he said he did. Your intent was quite literally to have that content open on that page. That's why you posted it. You're like, yeah, but I got, I got in trouble though. For, for doing this. I didn't flash those kids. When I tried to, the police stopped me. So I didn't fucking do anything wrong. That <laughs> 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 was this fucking little... <laughs> God, I hit my sword! <laughs> you made my sword fall! So yes, the posts were there, but you couldn't do anything with them because they were flagged. You are trying- But they were not flagged at one point because you uploaded them and they had likes on them. <laughs> this is the same exact thing as being like, I didn't send that underage person nude photos. When I tried to send the photos, they got intercepted. <laughs> when I tried to send the photos, they were on a plane and it didn't go through. <laughs> so I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> trying to paint the picture that I used Patreon solely because it had no age verification. No, that's while not- I one said no that. No one said that. He, there he, just isn't age verification on Patreon, like there is on OnlyFans. There's a reason why you can't post that stuff there, because they decide not to verify your age. Like, how do you not put that together when you're trying to be an NSFW content creator? Like, you- it's- it, <laughs> It's baffling. You should know where stuff goes. <laughs> so much of this is like, well, this is what he's boiling it down to. It ain't that deep. You posted content that kids could access and encourage them to find it by commenting and replying to them. So you're right, it isn't that deep. That's exactly what you're that's, doing. Yeah, that's very cut and dry, actually. I think you're trying to just complicate things, Tall Knight, to make it seem like it's more nuanced than it is. It's so much of the case of, like, he sees it as this black and white issue, is, like, if I am not explicitly sending a photo directly to an underage person, then what I'm doing is not wrong. But, no, there are plenty of things that are very, like, weird and unsettling about what you're doing. Yeah. Which is why you're making it into this big, like, complicated thing, when in reality, you're just doing that thing. That's what you meant to do. Even if you could be, like, really charitable and, and, like, assume that he's doing all of this on accident, like, he's really that stupid, you should still face repercussions for replying to people without fucking checking that they were 13. Yeah, you literally, it's so, if you're going to be a sex worker. sex worker at all in any sense you need to take that responsibility that you can't be communicating with people underage how is that different than someone paying to go through the paywall and interact with you that way and also the twitter thing too replying <laughs> to minors and then just having an 18 plus twitter yeah. there is no age verification on twitter you literally like like what could you just look up like a picture of his butthole straight from the fucking tiktok that's crazy you shouldn't that's be wild. able to do that the only reason i tried to use patreon once tried. and it didn't even work because it pays more than only fans that is all the only thing i am guilty of is being too lazy to check someone's bio before responding to their comment but like and for that lot. i am sorry and obviously from now on i'm gonna be checking everyone's bio <laughs> he seems like he's really he really genuinely he really, yeah, he's really thought sorry. about it and he feels bad. <laughs> but a simple, honest mistake like that, that anyone could have made, does not make me a pedophile. Anyone? So please, for the love of God, move on with your life and stop attacking me. So this is the, that's what we just watched, yeah, right? That, the stitch that we just watched was post, from Tall Night was posted five hours ago. And then now he has. If you can give me. <laughs> <laughs> no! No shot! He put together a timeline, a written timeline. With a little skull. <laughs> of the death 
of the tall knight. This is what, and he's also been caught lying about multiple things up until this point. Yeah, the thirteen year old, the fifteen year old, the actual content being on the Patreon, which he straight up said he has not posted anything. Yeah, he to. straight up said it was just the tears, and then he took the tears down when the videos were taken down after being up. And the only reason these tears exist there is because I was originally going to post it there. Why? Because Patreon only takes 12% of your income. So the only reason those tears are there is because I was originally going to post stuff. All because enough people believe the stupid lie. All because of something that wasn't even true. And it doesn't matter if the Google Drive link doesn't work. There were likes on the thing. And then like, the Twitter, he just didn't acknowledge at all. Yeah, that he had a fully open, not safe for work. On his link tree, on his TikTok while replying to minors. Weird. I like I understand I feel like he thinks no one's getting what he's saying and everyone <laughs> who is against him understands the point he's trying to make. Yeah. Just not you're not following through with it because you keep Cause dodging there's, shit. Yeah, there's a point of responsibility that he's falling short on addressing because I mean look what he wrote down. OnlyFans, Patreon, no age verification, higher pay. You should have thought about that. Just a couple minutes, I can irrefutably prove how I'm innocent. He said that before already. All I ask is that you look at my YouTube channel. <laughs> oh my god. Completely dude. innocent? Really? Wild. This is wild. This is the month of August. We are there. This is when everything went down. It ran for almost exactly a week before it got reported and then taken down. But okay, so it ran. It literally, that's it. A it week. ran. It ran for a week. You promoted it and it was on there for a week. That's what, that's what people are saying. Yeah. And honestly, he could have literally responded to this in a way that would have like quieted the storm and made people be like oh okay if he whatever. was really just like hit the hard line of like i had no idea i'm really stupid this is a huge mistake i'm so sorry instead of being like i'm completely innocent <laughs> <laughs> i still cannot get over them i gotta go back to that yeah i still just cannot get Please over don't I've never seen anyone respond to anything in this way. It's bizarre. But now my life is ruined because now that I'm banned, the amount of money that I made from views, that was going to pay my rent. <laughs> but now that I'm banned, I'll never see a penny of it. All because of something that wasn't even f***ing true. And now now here I am again. Here I f***ing am again, hum... <laughs> You can't I gotta say wash my hands. Well, you got your legs spread out on the floor, little grippers on the ground. Like, ugh. who has ever done a response video where it's a point of view <laughs> with a face reveal at the end? POV, like you have voices in your head and you're trying to like battle them. <laughs> and he's just looking at the ground, like, why did this have to happen? Ugh. I wish he grabbed his sword. But now my life is P ruined o because you now right that I'm in banned, battle and the amount of money that I made from you. views, that was going to pay my rent. If you believe all the things you hear about me, please don't leave any more hate comments. I'm so tired. I can't take much more. Oh, I need to go to bed. Uh, <laughs> it just, there is a way to go about this in a way that would have saved your career. And you immediately just let your emotions just run wild. <laughs> Iron sharpens iron, brother strengthens, strengthens brother. brother. I think, is that biblical? And so the Tall Knight has this YouTube video that we kind of skip through and watch, and I wanted to cover it. I wanted to actually go through it, get all the facts and everything, but he continuously points people in other directions that have nothing to do with what he's getting in trouble for. He's like, oh, you guys are calling me a scammer because I'm asking for money and saying I'm homeless, but I'm actually homeless and I'm not, I'm, I don't actually want all your money. And again, there's so many YouTubers who cover this story and I would have wanted to cover it more in depth and actually really look into the story. But every single time I heard something from the tall night guy, it was just bullshit. It just turned out to be him deflecting something else that happened. Just because you didn't end up harming someone doesn't mean that you didn't have the intent to do something that you shouldn't have been doing. What? Hello. If you're watching this, that means you're here to figure out the truth of what's going on behind everything, and that means that you are the type of person who doesn't just <laughs> doesn't just believe shit. You actually do your own thorough investigating before forming an opinion, and I respect that profoundly. So, firstly, I want to say thank you for taking the time to actually come and hear my side of the story rather than just believing. Are there screenshots or like? 
Like, or is what? it just him talking about, like... That is where everything started for me. Blew up. It went mega viral. Wait, he was just talking about his background? Okay, keep skipping this. Keep... Get it out of here. Get it out. I did not need to do that. I could have... I could have... If I was scamming people, I would have taken as much money as I could have. He keeps taking, like, one yeah, thing from someone says, and then he's like, This is what you guys think of me! It's like, that's no... I haven't even seen one person bring that up. Yeah. That he was scamming anyone. And even if he wasn't, doesn't this prove that you must have plenty of money to go around? You're showing us that you, you had plenty of people sending you money, which also means you accepted money from minors who wanted to support you doing what you do online. Which is like, you can have a tip jar or whatever, but when that's where you're directing your content and your audience that you're responding to is clearly underage, how are you supposed to not look at that and go, yeah, wait, actually it does seem pretty creepy. There are these constant weird microaggressive things he'll say in his video that immediately make me feel like he isn't actually taking it seriously at all. And the Reddit moderator lingo is too much, man. No one's gonna be on your side. If And you do have a lot of people on your side, but they're all people that are amongst yeah. these comments. Instantly guilty. That you just delete in mass. And then all you see on the Tall Knights page are people, mostly younger women, saying that he should continue to be able to do what he wants to do, even though he was quite literally marketing this content towards younger people and not even like oh my god i can't even imagine having that kind of interaction with someone in my audience and that's only what we know was like public then the public facing of the tall night and the aggression overall that comes with all of this is what loses credibility on his end because he is obviously not upset with his own actions, not upset with anything that he caused on his own. He's upset with all these people that, for him, decided they didn't like him, and so they reported his page. Everything is a deflection. Everything is caused by people it's who personal. don't like him. It's all the haters. It could not be the tall knight. Stay in my house with of my course. children and me and my wife without asking first. And then in my third Wait, video, I... what is going on? There's so much we've missed. We have so much lore that we're missing out. Who on. is this guy? How did this happen so long ago? We can't. I, I'm like, we can't even cover. No, it's too much. We definitely just have to cover like the specific, <laughs> the specific thing that happened. But I am like, this is baffling to me that there's this much going on. Like, this is obviously a person that is. There's so much that has happened that you do not, like, you don't deserve this platform. <laughs> like, what? And all the disgusting things that she did, that people would call me the same thing that I would call her. But why is it copyrighted? What the fuck? That hurts more than you could possibly imagine. In no reality. You have to, like, back up and look at this and be like, Dude, you are sitting down with sad music on with a night helmet on. You yeah. are doing this with a helmet on. So, it's so silly. I can't. <laughs> Take off the helmet. I mean, <laughs> it is far beyond the point where the helmet should have come off. You already did a face reveal. What's the point? Yeah, there's no point in the helmet anymore. Literally, why? It's so goofy to watch him just like sit here for half an hour in this helmet with his glasses on it from the outside. <laughs> Off she said scared. that specifically when I begged her to let us stay at the apartment. She was so mad that she wanted me homeless. Even though she kicked me out, I got $30,000. She was so mad. So Wait, wait. What? Is he saying that he made 30 k off of the cash app? No way. Because if so, what is he saying? He's He wouldn't... This He posted that like three days ago. <laughs> It was in the middle of the night. It was like like 11 or 12, and she kicked us out. Wait, he got kicked out because you brought... Sister let you stay at her house, but then he said it was the middle of the night. So did she wake up and realize that you're, like, bringing people into her house when you're yeah. supposed to be homeless? Because that's like, insane. Oh, she my God. She was pissed that I had a girl over, so she decided to kick me out. And it was to grab and then my he shows footage of him in the into snow. the snow. But that was like the scammers allegations. I don't care about the scammer That's not what we're talking about. I don't think he's a scammer. I think he's just like a weird guy. He's a weirdo. And I don't, I wouldn't trust him around these freaks. No, he's a freak. Yeah. Wait, trust him. my Insta story never uploaded? God damn it. Around the kid freaks. No kids 
kids, don't look at this guy. Guys, if you're a kid and you're watching, don't look at that guy. Don't look at us. So yeah, I think that's all that Ethan and I are going to deep dive into. I do urge you to watch other videos on this if you're interested in stuff that happened in the past because I've heard so many stories about ways that he has gotten into controversy in the past and deflected it and continued to make the kind of content he makes. And no, you don't just get Ooh. to like throw a tantrum and then expect everyone to feel bad for you and bring you back onto TikTok. That's just like not how the internet works. You don't get to make a mistake and then be upset at other people for the mistake. And so yeah, I think that's it. Classic, classic narcissist shit. I wanna thank Ethan, Ethan is online, or Pethan are his both his channels. You should go check them out. I think he has a video on his main channel out today. So you should check it out. It's really funny. I watched it yesterday. Queef Jerky has an album out with Ethan on every single song. Queef Underground, you know what it is. Pineapple Upside Down just hit a million streams. It's crazy. Here's all Let's my go. channels on the screen. Oh, they're over here. Now they're over here. Yep, I know visual effects. Anyways, I got some videos up on the screen, a couple playlists for drama. The He Said Us video Ethan and I made yesterday. I think I'm ready put the cap back on, put my normal glasses back on, and get ready. Wait, what? Why does he have... Wait, what? I need to put this bad boy out. I hope you guys have a real great Friday. Follow me at Nick is not green on Instagram if you want to let me know what kind of videos you want me to make. I guess that's it. Bye. St. Bernard shirt. White missionary in Haiti. Nope. Not today. Not today. I'm getting a little bit of a headache. I don't know if it's from the paint fumes or what, but um, I'm going to call it a night. I appreciate you. Um, thank you for hanging out with me tonight. Um, I will be back tomorrow, uh, probably with just like some fun reacts. Uh, just I'm burnt. And I also I want to finish this painting um, as soon as possible. So probably be working on that tomorrow as well. Um, uh, drink some water, take care of yourself, um, and bye-bye.